Hey to everybody, how are you doing? Uh, so welcome to this presentation. Uh, this is something that I've been kind of going around and doing a little bit around the, the state of Minnesota. I did it in Vir Virginia uh, last fall, Hermantown, and then Detroit Lakes uh, just recently this last October. And so um, one of the things that I wanted to do as I did all this is to kind of put things together in a way that I could provide it for you guys and do it in a way that it's broken down and separated over two nights so that we could really dive into some of these topics because they're extremely important. And a lot of the things that we're going to be talking about, <clears throat> you'll see that over the course of the year or the la last couple, two years, some of the terminology that we've been using and that we'll use continues to shift and change and things like that. So uh, for uh, tonight, what I want to do is just basically examine the biblical concept of what a woman is. And so we'll get there. Uh, but before, we'll start examining how we got to even having this conversation in the first place. And then I'll talk a little bit as we get into it what you can expect for tomorrow. But before we get any further, let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you for bringing us together tonight. Uh, we thank you for your word that continues to lead and guide us as we interact with uh, so many of the issues that we find ourselves uh, confronted with and some of the confusion uh, that just continues to permeate our own minds, hearts, and, uh, and, and communities. And we ask that you bless our conversation uh, this evening and especially tomorrow as well. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So the first thing I want to do is just talk about uh, what this is not. Um, so a lot of times when you even bring up uh, transgenderism, trans ideology, uh, transvestitism, uh, gender dysphoria, all of a sudden all these stigmas start coming in and all of a sudden people start getting labeled by a whole lot of things and accusations start flying. So the first thing is, is that we're not coming here because we're uh, afraid of this conversation or we're afraid of the ideology that we've been confronted with or that's out there in our communities or anything like that. We're simply here uh, to explore some of the facets of what we see around us and what our families and friends might be interacting with and it might be challenged with. Um, and the other thing is, is this isn't misogynistic. This isn't something where you're, you know, it's funny, my, my, my girls, they went to the one down in Hermantown and all the way down to Duluth as we were making our way down there. Um, they were asking me how, how I thought I could possibly have a conversation on what it meant to be a woman because I had to read a book about it, right? <laughs> And, uh, and it's, it's funny, uh, but it's the same, it, it, but we want to make sure that it's not what it appears at first glance. A middle-aged white guy standing in front, in front of a room of women telling you what it means to be a woman, right? And that's not what this at all is. It's an exposition on what scripture teaches about the God-given identity that we have as uh, the, the feminine in God's created order. Uh, the other thing is, it's like it goes back to that, that, um, uh, that transphobic, it's not fear-based in any way, right? It's not transphobic or homophobic or any of these things, these buzzwords that a lot of times, as soon as you bring up these conversations, just start getting thrown out. Um, and the other thing is, it's not a political conversation. You know, there's a lot of life issues that are out there in this world, you know, whether we're talking about... Uh, euthanasia or abortion, or we're talking about um, here with the gender identity issue. A lot of times the political arena tries to gravitate, you know, use gravity to bring these conversations into their sphere as if that's where they belong. But per people's identity, who God created them to be, is, is not something that's defined by any side of an aisle. Now, this is something that's rooted and anchored in what Scripture teaches us. Um, the other thing is, is it's not about hate in any way or any capacity, right? There, we're not here to, to, to argue or to cast dispersions against uh, different uh, individuals or groups. Uh, this conversation tonight and tomorrow night is simply about truth, exploring it, and continuing to immerse ourselves in it. So here's some ground rules. One, we're mature and we can handle this topic. Um, one, somebody asked me how young an individual can be to come and participate in this. My daughter, she was 11 when she came, and Lily was 13, my oldest daughter. And um, we're mature even at that age. The, the thing that I talk about is human anatomy and 
um, our sexual organs and things like that. And I think the, the fact that we're apprehensive about that discussion paints a real clear picture of why we're having this conversation in the first place. Because when you look at your genitals and your physical or your, your sex organs, it's interesting how the world has just had a heyday with them, right? They, they label them as all sorts of different things that are derogatory and inhumane, um, but what has the church come and met uh, those, those types of perversions with? Because what God has given you as a, as a participant in his creation is a beautiful, blessed thing. And we have just let the world use these things as derogatory and profane language instead of being able to harness them for what they really are as God's gifts. Um, but we'll, that's, a, that's a different topic, but it leads into this concept that we're mature and we can handle it and we can have these conversations. So if you need a break from the discussion, sure, that's perfectly okay. Go ahead and take it. Just uh, There's bathrooms down that way. There's a drinking fountain up that, up that aisle or up the staircase as you make your way through the upper narthex or lower narthex. So uh, just go ahead. I just invite you to make sure you come back. Um, we're not here to single people out, so at the end of the discussion, I'll make time for us to be able to ask questions, so I just uh, ask you to be just uh, 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 courteous about that. Uh, one of the things we are doing is we're going to be recording this and putting it on our YouTube channel here in a couple weeks, so if you do have questions, uh, we just ask you not to use names and things like that, because then we'll have to edit it out for people's privacy and things. <clears throat> The other thing is, is uh, we're not here to make light of this topic. It's really easy uh, to just laugh some of these things off and some of this uh, discussion off as not being serious um, being, uh, and, and actually start ridiculing and making fun of individuals that might be struggling from that. And this is the opposite of that. Right? This is not a light topic. Um, it's not something that's going away. And the people that are interacting with it and the people that are truly identifying as gender dysphoric are suffering. And so this isn't, uh, this isn't uh, a, uh, an attempt to make light of this at all. The most important thing, and this will come back up especially tomorrow night as we realize um, about what's happening here. Um, this isn't about individual against individual, parents against children, doctors against pa parents. When we get down to brass tacks, when we approach this as a Christian perspective, we remember what Ephesians 5 teaches us. We're not wrestling against flesh and blood. You're not wrestling against a new generation of human beings. You're not wrestling against the neighbor or against a political rival. You're wrestling against these spiritual forces of evil in this present age. One of the greatest things that Satan accomplishes in our modern era is getting you and I to think each other are the enemy and forgetting that he's out there lurking, looking for someone to devour. And so when we come back to these concepts and these ideologies and these philosophies that took root and started to take shape in the 50s and 60s and even before then and now blossoming into what we have today, we have to remember what the real origin is, right? So there we go. Night two. This is a lot of people have asked, well, at the end you can ask questions. I know your family, so... <laughs> but... <laughs> So tonight, um, I'll go through the, you have the outline for what we're going to be doing tonight. Some people have asked me already tonight, what are we going to be talking about tomorrow? Uh, so um, uh, tonight, here's, we're going to be talking about what happened to womanhood, uh, reinforcing stereotypes, how we actually see the trans ideology, reinforcing some of the things that it says it's trying to dismantle. Uh, we're going to see the historical development of gender identity crisis, uh, how even when you look at the universities, how back in the 80s and 90s you used to go to university and take women's study courses. I remember that very clearly. And now when you go, it's gender studies. And so what is the significance there? That's a, that's a really important distinction. Um, and then we'll launch into what I consider uh, kind of the, the undertone of all this, which is called, I call it a, a modern garden movement, uh, a moment for the church. Um, and then we'll go into the biblical ex, uh, examination of the eternal nature of what it means to be a woman, which won't take us but five minutes, right? No. Um, and then we'll have some uh, question and answers after that. That's when you can raise your hand, right? <laughs> so tomorrow night, so like I've, when I advertised this, or at least we're announcing it, I was saying these aren't, 
These aren't the same conversations in two nights, uh, over two nights. It's, it's, it's actually two separate conversations. Tomorrow night, we're going to be talking about the blurring of words. Um, and you, we're going to see a little bit of that tonight, but really examining how language and the use of certain vocabulary words when we're talking about these issues have become very obscure and how we can start actually seeing what's meant behind some of the words that are being used. We're also going to be talking about specific mental health uh, definitions, paraphilic disorders, uh, transvestitism. We'll talk about gender dysphoria, its prevalence uh, in our communities, what we can expect. And then we'll be going into uh, the biological and genetic considerations of dispositions when individuals look like, uh, are looking at why they're struggling this way. Because that is one of the, the things that's paramount about our human existence. When we're suffering and struggling, we want to know why. And so you'll see a lot of research going into, you know, is this a learned behavior? Is this a societal pressure? Is this something that we're genetically disposed to? So we'll be talking about those things tomorrow night as well. Then we'll be talking about the consider, considering all the varying therapies that go into gender dysphoria and um, transitional therapies and such uh, hormonal therapies. Then I want to talk about suicidal behavior and the myths that are associated with that, especially pertaining to this population. Uh, because back in the 90s, ABC had this big headline that it, it, it asked the simple question, do you want a dead son or a, 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 a live daughter? And what it was saying was, um, if you try to talk to your child who identifies as a trans woman, that you're immediately going to push them in to commit suicide. Like, that's the only other option. And you see some of that, that language and that narrative even today in some of the protests and things you see around town, that, or not this town, but around our country, where you say that if you don't support them, that the only other option is for this catastrophic experience. And then we'll talk about how this touches the LBGT community and impacts the world beyond it, and then our Christian approach, again, won't take very long to get through all that stuff. So now you can see why I wanted to break it out over two nights. The last three times I did this, I, try, I tried to do it all in one sitting. So hopefully this will be a little bit more of bite sizes for everybody. Oh, and then, of course, questions and answers, right? Okay. So session one. Everybody ready? Okay. <clears throat> so... One of the reasons why a lot of times people ask, why did you even get into this? Um, one is because I started seeing this trend go on when it talk, uh, in, our, in our world about how it uh, started describing women uh, in, our, in our circles, in our roles, in our communities, uh, in our agencies and organizations. All of a sudden, the word her was, uh, was replaced with they. Now, that might not sound like it's very dr dramatic, but think about it. All of a sudden, now it's a third-person pronoun. This isn't even a personable thing. It's not even individualistic. It's, it's now divorcing an individual from being a, a person now to being a they a more obscure category. And then all of a sudden, a bride is a significant other. A wife is a partner. A mother is a parenting or a birthing parent. Um, uh, you have, wait, wait, yep, you have uh, a menstruating person. Um, this is something in gynecology, gynecology magazines. Now, all of a sudden, they're retracting the words, uh, the words of women and uh, some of these more specific pronouns that refer to the female gender, replacing it with things like that. Um, uh, owners of vaginas, that's another term that was described in a, a gynecology magazine and, and journal. Uh, persons with the capacity of pregnancy. Uh, that she is taken, uh, she and feminine woman, all these things that used to be used to describe and elevate and really embrace the, the female in God's creative order has been now taken to this concept of being so vague and at times blatantly offensive. I, I, I oftentimes find myself when I'm reading through some of this literature thinking, where in the world are our feminists from the, from the 20th century. The, the whole point of uh, some of these feminists, and we'll get to them in a minute, is to try, to try to see women as more than their biological body parts. But then now all of a sudden we're so advanced here in 2023 and 24 that we're referring to women as owners of vaginas. We have completely gone full circle. And, and I just don't know where these women are that should be, you know, and men, 
and I'll get to that at the end, right? Because this is not just a female and a woman's issue. The men, our husbands and brothers and sons need to be standing beside uh, the women in creation. This, that was the whole reason why, you know, Eve was preyed upon by Satan in the garden and Adam was standing there silent. And so this is a call to men just as, as much as it is to women. So thank you guys for showing up. Um, so what we've seen over the last few years is something that women being tr- uh, ch- changed into something that's undefinable, uh, their identity, their uniqueness, and their significance is all of a sudden being pushed into this, uh, uh, being pressured to be uh, seen as con- uh, in the lens of being con- conforming to something that they're really no different uh, than anything else. And really, when when you boil down to it, being a woman is just irrelevant. Um, And you'll see how what started out as that feminist movement in the the 20th and 19th century of trying to get women to be seen as more than biological determinism now has actually gotten to this point where women are irrelevant. And so that's a... And you'll see that in just a little bit. So... The other reason why is because as I, was, as I do all this reading, which my wife laughs at me all the time because she never knew that when she was going to go to the mailbox that she would be opening the mailbox to all these womenist and fe- f- feminist books and women's studies and gender studies books and just continue to open it up. But as I continue to do all this, the one thing I was always missing was, and this is why I say it's targeted towards women. Because you don't see anybody, any men out there being described as prostate havers. <laughs> I've, never, I've never been described. There's not a box that I check when I go to the doctor that way. Or persons with the capacity of semen. <laughs> it's not a thing. Right? Or penis owners. Right? These are not things that you see or hear uh, when you go to the urologist. You're a man. Right? And you're there for uh, your prostate exam. You're not seen as these individuals like women have been shoved and categorized as people with the capacity of pregnancy. Right? And so this is where, it, for me, is one of the eye-opening and aha moments of, okay, this is, this is targeted and systematic. Okay? And one of the things that I always want to keep in mind as we make our way through this presentation and tomorrow night too is we're not here, like I said, um, uh, to be combative, to be argumentative, but really as we explore the scriptural realities of womanhood is that we're speaking truth in love, right? And we're reaching out and, and that's what's going to guide our response when we look tomorrow night at how we respond as Christians, where we're reaching out to these communities and these individuals with truth in love, in, um, I'm going to pick on this, uh, but in our, our, our kindergarten's, uh, kindergartner's classroom, or one of the kindergarten classrooms, because he, he was going to one or the other, it said, uh, between, the choice, uh, between kindness and being right, I choose kindness. And, you know, at first glance, that's, that quote, or, or however you want to say it, sounds really nice, but at, at what point in time in history did we get to that those two things are mutually exclusive? In fact, as Christians, we're called to be anchored in truth and loving at the same time. But for whatever reason, o- over the, the course of a lot of different things taking place over who knows how many years, all of a sudden these things are mutually exclusive. If you can't, you can be kind or you can be right. When in reality, those two things come together in beautiful ways, especially when we come to the scripture, right? Okay. So what is a woman? That question right there has been described by a lot of individuals as what's the modern day witch hunt. And not just... um, uh, not just when we're talking about, you know, churches or any of this other stuff, but in all capacities. Ken Zucker, he was uh, one of the lead uh, gender identity uh, specialists up in Canada running in a hospital up there. Um, we'll talk about him more tomorrow, but he was, he, he pioneered the response, the treatment for uh, uh, early onset gender dysphoria for children, uh, that the treatment should be, Pay, or, uh, watchful waiting, 
right? And we'll talk about why that is. But because he said watchful waiting and not a lot of the other more aggressive treatments, he was ostracized. Things were lied about him. He was basically um, just a, a scapegoat. And people demanded his resignation and all sorts of different things. Uh, Lord of the Rings, of course, and many of you probably know the, the author of Lord of the Rings, how she came out um, publicly on her Twitter page and talked about how a woman is a woman. And what's interesting is that she describes herself as a feminist and she is a lesbian feminist. But yet now, she, even this, the, the, the movement that we see now has isolated her. She has a great uh, a picture that she posted on her Twitter page after people started targeting her, and the picture literally had her standing up with a T-shirt that said, this witch doesn't burn. And it is basically based on this whole idea that the whole trans ideology and the trans movement is this new witch hunt. Yes. You're right. Harry Potter series. Let's make a note of change in that. <laughs> So thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So in, in this witch hunt that they talk about, you start to see it. You know, one of the things that I always, I, I take for granted, to be honest with you, is my, my profession. I don't deal with this pressure in my profession. But I can't imagine what it would be like for people that are in the medical field, right? Uh, people that are in academia, uh, people that are in government, p people that are in uh, positions of broadcasting or in any places on social media. You know, you guys are impacted by this in profound ways. And uh, I talk with my, my in-laws and things like that and some of the stuff they experience with their, um, with their trainings and things, how this type of stuff is just, is just coming in waves. Um, and you start to see um, uh, how this is impacting individuals in such negative ways. So how did we get to this point? Uh, that's kind of where we are on the outline. Uh, so this woman right here in front of you is Simone de Beauvoir. Uh, she's a 20th century French philosopher. And she is really one of the, I guess, godmothers, if you will, of, of feminism that emerged. Uh, she really looked at uh, what the concept of being a female was and tried to answer this question that we're here to get to today to discuss. What does it mean to be a woman? And she talked about how, you know, being a woman really has nothing to do with the biological things that you were born with. Um, it has to do with how society pushed you into certain categories or at least oppressed you and kept you down. And so she, one of the big quotes that she had as she was going around and teaching and philosophizing, if that's a word, is, uh, is saying that you're not born a woman, you simply become one through your life and through your experiences and how the society and the culture that you're in shapes you based on their expectations. And so being a woman from what the world sees as a woman is not something you're given at conception or at birth, but it's something that is actually thrust upon you and shapes you as you go on. Now, John Mooney, he's a huge person. Actually, he is the godfather, I guess you would, if, uh, if Simone de Beauvoir is the godmother of feminism. He's the godfather of gender studies. He was the first one to actually make a distinction and teach the difference between biological sex and gender and to separate those two things out. He had this uh, study where he was uh, approached by a family uh, with a young son who had a, a really traumatic incident during his circumcision. And because of that, uh, the reconstruction of the little boy's penis just wasn't an option. So what they did is ended up uh, surgically altering him so he resembled a girl. John Mooney then encouraged the family to raise this little boy as if he had always been a girl because he believed that biological sex and gender expression and experience were completely different and those things were shaped by your societal expectations. A lot of what uh, Simone was teaching, that being a woman is something you became. And so he took those teachings and applied it to your lived experiences that tragically, that little boy, he learned when he was 15 years old that he was born a boy and he had a twin brother. By the time he was 37, he was so severely depressed he took his own life. 
And, oh, and by the way, they, after decades, they realized that most of the stuff that John Mooney actually taught, um, he really inflated. Some of his claims were completely false. Um, so he's been discredited. But during the time and the emergence of gender identity, he was, he was the, par- the, the, the principal in all of that. Judith Butler came on the, the heels of Simone, and, and she is famous for always quoting Simone, but really took off with this whole concept of feminism and, and what it meant to be a woman and, and really trying to harness it in. Now, what she actually said was she said biological sex, just, it, she didn't even deal with it. She said it's not important at all. What matters to be a woman um, is your experience and how you grow and how you want to define being a woman. Because if someone labels you a woman, they're limiting you. They've already defined who you are and they've placed unnecessary expectations on you. You get to decide what it means to be a woman for you and it's a very fluid thing. And in fact, if you read her Um, read some of her books, it's just very confusing as she continues to go up and down in in circles and ask herself lots of questions. But that's really what it is, is her saying, you can't even define people as woman or other, because once you give a person a definition, now you're restricting them. So being a woman is not something that you can put a definition to. Now you can see why just a couple years ago we have uh, Supreme Court Justice Brown being asked in front of the Judiciary Committee in her hearings, what does it mean to be a woman? Surprisingly, she says, I don't know what it means to be a biologist, right? I'm not a biologist. I can't answer that question, okay? You have professors uh, from UC Berkeley teaching law arguing for women's rights and their access to abortion and telling the, the con- congressional committee that it's not a women's issue, it's people with the capacity of pregnancy because men, can, men might need abortions. Right? And uh, this is really, really important, at least when I'm starting to go through this, because when you think about feminism, liberating women from oppression, you have two minority women standing in front of a world stage and saying, there is no definition of a woman. What has this world done? What have we done to the fact that these, these women should be cherished and held up? Example, the first female black U.S. Supreme Court justice, and she's not going to say what it means to be a woman? What's driving this? You know, for me, like I said, these are just red flags, but... And then you have Drew Barrymore actually during the the year of, you know, celebrating women, kneeling before a trans uh, trans woman and and apologizing and talking about her greatest critic being herself and having this heart-to-heart moment with this person that identifies as a woman. And so we have come... In such a weird, you know, a weird is a, a kind of an interesting thing, but a, a, in a sense, a very fascinating way, uh, a journey to where we are now. Starting out trying to figure out what it means to be a woman and to break the shackles of society, trying to say that biological determinism requires that you stay at home and have children and, and stay in the, you know, uh, you know, making bread and all that other different stuff. <laughs> bursting forth from that to now saying women is undefinable and even a man can uh, can become a woman so um that's that's kind of uh, how we got to where we're at now as you take john mooney's idea and paradigm of being able to say we need to separate gender and sex this is why it gets so confusing a lot of times when people talk about transgender uh because they'll say that it's not even the same thing and, and that biological sex isn't something that uh, should really even be talked about or considered. But in your classrooms and sweeping across the Eastern or the Western world is this di- diagram and it'll appear in different school, school settings and different classrooms. And it's used to guide children in being able to understand their gender identity, their gender expression, 
be able to recognize their biological sex and then be able to talk about their sexual orientation. So it's taking who the person is and instead of bringing all that in it together and to form an identity, it's taking individuals and dividing them out and parsing people off to be juxtaposed against each other. That all of a sudden we're harnessing and cultivating a, a young person or even maybe an older person's mind to think that their mind is at war with their body. And we'll talk about the significance of that going forward. But this is where you, all of a sudden, you get from John Mooney to now the genderbred person in, in, in the classrooms around our communities. Because now there's a difference between the gender you were born with and what your gender experience, or your, in your, or your gender experience, or the biological sex you were born with in your gender experience. Okay. The gender, so now I just want to show you this is a snapshot of what we might be talking about tomorrow, okay? So where you might be able to say, I am a man that identifies as a woman, right? That's just one experience or one way that we ex experience the gender-bred person and how that's being taught uh, when we talk about uh, children or adults when they are uh, uh, dealing with some of these, uh, these issues. Here's just a short list of some of the things that now are included in that title of being transgender, okay? So a lot of times you think of transgender as being just a certain thing. And I think that is one of the things that's really confusing now as we make our way forward into history, is we think we've already, we've already know what people are talking about when they start talking about being transgender, when in reality there is a whole catalog of stuff behind it. And being able to be with that individual and know exactly what they're talking about is crucially important. Again, we'll talk more about that tomorrow. All right. Now we can talk about what a woman is. Many of you guys probably know Matt Walsh. Um, he, he, you know, he's very popular. He wrote that book, What is a Woman? Um, I don't, don't quote him, uh, but I do hear talk about some of his findings. He went out on the community in San Francisco, New York, some of these big metropolitan areas, and he just asked individuals, sometimes in pride parades and things like that, to be able to say, can you tell me what a woman is? Here are some of the examples of what uh, individuals he interviewed said. A person who, and this is, these are quotes, that's why they sound kind of funny, but it says, a person who likes, who likes to be pretty and thinks of themselves as delicate. Another person said, a choice. Okay, not a choice, but like uh, an option. Like you're, I suppose it's because you're not determined from the moment you're born. You're freer. So you can see that influence of Judith Butler kind of in that context. I think someone who identifies as a woman. Uh, so what is a woman and her, ide uh, her, her identity based on? According to those things, uh, uh, preference of a behavioral tendency, right? Feeling pretty, that kind of stuff. Uh, is it an impulse, someone that feels this way, is compelled at the moment to identify that way? Is it seen in cultural norms? This is why it's getting so confusing because people are looking for something to anchor them in this conversation. And that's where we come here tonight, right? Where are we getting this idea of what it means to be a woman? Well, we, we look towards something bigger, something from outside of us. These other things are from inside of us, except for the cultural norms, of course, but, but instead of looking inward for answers and truth, all of a sudden we look from outside of us, something bigger like a creator. Um, one of the things that um, I always like to do is go back to uh, some of the early writings in the early 1900s uh, uh, that talk about this kind of feminist dilemma that was taking place. The first time questions really started being uttered about what it actually means to be a woman. Probably one of the most poignant times in history when this question was crucial was during the First World War. And it was, uh, it was uttered by German women. And the reason was, is because all these women were going to, uh, or all these men were being enlisted and they were taken to the front lines. And in fact, uh, some of, Gert, there's this a philosopher named Gertrude, beautiful books that she has written. One is called The Eternal Woman. But she talks about how there were going, they, the women in Germany were afraid that there was going to be no men to marry because they were all going to be buried in Normandy. 
So they needed to figure out what it meant to be a woman because what it meant to be a woman was about to dramatically change because there weren't going to be any men to do any of the other stuff in the culture. So they were going to have to figure it out. And so that's what kind of rose this conversation. Um, and then you have World War II, of course. And you have all, a lot of the men being enlisted and drafted and taken off into war. Uh, and you have women here going to the factories. Rosie the Riveter. And you have this now challenging this cultural norm, but also deeper than that, trying to answer the question of what it meant to be a woman. And then, of course, you got Annie's Got a Gun. This is something with three older sisters that I grew up hearing all the time, right? Constantly, my sisters would sing, you know, anything you can do, I can do better, right? And you have this idea of this culture, not, not, not trying to answer the question about what it meant to be a woman or a man, but something that was described as, as something else that was going on in our society, a cultural w or a, a, a war of the sexes. Now, all of a sudden, the sexes were at war. Men and women were at war with each other about what it meant to be who they were. And so what transpired after that? Of course, we have women entering the work field because that's something that they continued to do after World War II and fought for those positions. You have women's suffrage and you have women's voting, their equal rights and those types of things, which are all really good. You then had, of course, Vietnam. Now, do any of the ladies remember any, anything like this happening in history? I'm not going to tell you who's laughing secretly, but no. <laughs> do, you know, do you guys remember, for, you, for those of you who might have seen this on TV, or, or maybe <laughs> uh, what was happening alongside these women burning their bras? What was happening usually just right maybe 50 feet away? Men were burning their draft cards. It was Vietnam. This was an era of independence and liberation and this type of contra, you know, uh, trying to oppose the institutions and things like that. And so you had this breaking open, all of a sudden now, defining who we were and who we are as human beings wasn't the goal. Right? And then you have the sexual, liber uh, sexual uh, revolution. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, what transpired, moving from the sexual revolution, was not just... Uh, freeing the, the female body for sexual, sexual expression, but freeing all bodies in any sexual expression um, to the point where now the most important thing about making you a person is you being able to do what makes you happy. And that is not at all what we're called to be as Christians or wrapped up in God's economy. And we're not, we're created for relationships and we're created to serve one another. And, and, and this is a farce. Are we ever going to be able to achieve happiness in this life? Right? And then you have Emma Watts, Harry Potter again, right? Um, and this uh, was one of the things that she posted uh, in response uh, to that author was, I don't want other people to decide who I am. I want to decide that for myself. Again, going back to Judith Butler and Simone de Beauvoir, I am who I will choose to be. So at the very, at the very front of this, it seems like, well, you know, it's a very freeing thing. But what happens when you get to decide who you get to be based on your emotions or the moments, impulses in your life? Pretty soon you find yourself like these individuals. This is an organization um, out on the West Coast called Stop Having Babies. These are children that are, used, that are out protesting. And um, it's all about this concept of being so egocentric that life is about what makes me happy. You have some of these things um, that, uh, uh, that you have. This, and I pointed out to this one. Specifically, I, my, my point of order, abortion is an act of love, right? What, what kind of act of love is it? Who are you loving? You know, and um, part of the reason why they say that is because that organization teaches that all, basically, your child is just going to grow up to hate themselves and want to commit suicide. So why would you have kids in the first place if that's how they're going to end up? Talk about 
uh, an organization that's really there to pick you up, right, and support you. So let's go into my garden moment. How are we doing on time? Pretty good. No? Not good. No, that's good. All right. All right. So a garden moment. You know, a lot of times when I talk about this, people will say, well, why did you pick that? That doesn't even make sense. What do you mean by garden moment? I'm talking about Satan approaching Eve and saying, did God really say that? And confronting what God's word is about, I, about their role in creation and their purpose in creation and, and attacking it. And here we are at a, at a threshold where you have women, certain women, feminists like Kathleen Scott and some of these other individuals trying to fight this wave, but are being cast out of all sorts of different places and men just remaining silent like Adam was uh, that first time. So uh, it might at first seem like a, a relatively a good idea and some of these concepts of being free or some of these philosophies of feminism, but it's intentionally deceptive, and we'll talk about why. One of the things that it talks about is that the trans movement and gender studies now and uh, uh, some of these things is to destroy the stereotype. And you'll hear some of this language, too, when people talk about trans ideology and being transgender is that they don't conform to a stereotype. But in fact, if you actually boil down the arguments, that's exactly what they're doing. They are being hip hypocrite. This I and it's not the individuals, it's the ideology. So keep coming back to that. Remember, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. It's an ideology and a philosophy. And it is Hippocratic because it actually reinforces it. One of the studies, uh, one of the, the tests that you can take, whether you're in Australia, Japan, or in the UK, if you are trying to figure out whether or not you might be, uh, might be uh, uh, suffering from some sort of gender dysphoric situation in your life, they'll ask you a question. It's called the G.I. Joe Barbie survey. Are, are you, would you describe yourself as hard or, or maybe soft? Are you aggressive or, or are you more passive? Are you strong or are you weak? Are you tough or are you sensitive? Are you independent? Are you dependent? Are you rational? Are you emotional? Uh, are you one who takes part in things, kind of follows along? Or are you one that takes charge? How is that not reinforcing stereotypes? I grew up with my oldest sister describing herself as the galactic empress. She is not over here by Barbie, okay? Okay. There is nothing wrong, and this is the beauty part about you and I as we talk about God's creative role and how he moves us and creates us who we are. We're not all going to be sensitive, and not all men are going to be aggressive. God's created us individually and specifically with all sorts of... So are we going to have men that are, that are more, uh, uh, you know, that could identify with uh, things on one side of the spectrum or, the, or another? Of course Right? Are we going to have women that are going to be, uh, we, Sarah and I, we used to have a, we still, she's a good friend of ours, but we have a good friend, she did the, the, the caber toss at the, um, at the Highland Games. Have anybody know what that is? It's where you pick up a log and you throw it as far as you can, right? And these are, you know, 20 foot logs. I mean, these are, to, to say that, and, and then to ridicule, saying that, oh, well, she must be butch, or she must be a lesbian, or she must really identify as a man. That's not at all what that is, right? And so you can see how this trans ideology, even though it says it wants to break down stereotypes, what it actually does is reinforce them very profoundly. And the other thing that it does is that it says that if you're a woman and you identify in these other things, like, well, you're more aggressive and you're a more take charge, independent kind of woman, then you're, you're probably a man and you need to change yourself physically. What, when did we get to that point where you have to change yourself to be accepted? So this, those are some of the contradictions that we're going to get into tomorrow night. So... One of the other things that you're going to hear about as you go out into the world and talk about trans ideology is people say, well, are you, what, what, what uh, sex were you assigned at birth? I always like to ask this question. How many women here have given birth? A fair number, okay. Did your doctor assign the birth of your child? What did uh, the doctor do when the child was born? It said it's a boy. Discovered it. Right? That's the thing that, that you got. Terminology is really important. 
Ver, vo, you know, and vocabulary is real important. And what doctor would ever, ever say they have the power to assign a gender upon birth? You see what that, what that actually insinuates is that the birthing doctor would actually be able to make a choice right there and to, to, to have some sort of say in the matter, when in reality it doesn't. The reason why trans ideology brings this up is a conversation about intersex, people that are born with varying chromosomes and other things like that, uh, ambiguous genitalia, and we're going to talk about that tomorrow night. But the reality thing is, is that doctors don't assign birth or assign sex at, at birth. They discover it, okay? Um, and the same thing, we're going to talk about this tomorrow night, so I'm just going to go through these. This is this biological reality. You know, Scripture tells us to search creation and to see God's fingerprints and to see His glory. And we see that even at microscopic levels. So again, this is a garden moment, and it's all about did God actually say. The other presupposition that this conversation takes is the fact that God is the holder of truth and that we aren't. And even when you look at the scientific revolution, one of the key people in that, uh, Johannes Kepler, um, he saw the scientific revolution, even looking at, like we were saying with chromosomal stuff, is that science is simply merely thinking God's thoughts after him. And that's, that's all we're doing, even today as we make our way into this. All right, so what did God say? God said in Genesis 1, God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created them. Male and female he created them. And he blessed them. And, gave, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and of the birds of the air and heaven, or birds of the heavens and over every living creature that moves on the earth. So when you look at God creating, it's not simply that he's building something in his garage. You as a human being are broken up into yourself, and part of yourself is seen in your mind, your body, and your soul. One of the most profound ways to be able to, to see how this is a reality that we all live with and accept and understand, and at least a fundamental way, is when you get diagnosed with a disease. When was the last time someone came up to you and said, um, my body has cancer? What do they usually say? I have cancer. Because it's not something that you can separate one from another. And in fact, even with psychology since about the late 80s and 90s, have been making huge uh, polls in this direction, recognizing the importance of soul care and holistic care of the individual, mind, body, and soul, and seeing that as true health. And so we see that we're not just one-dimensional individuals. We're not just our thoughts. We're, we're not just our soul. And we're not uh, just our bodies either. All those things wonderfully working together is what makes us a human being. So the whole person. And we see this represented in Scripture. You should love the Lord your God with your whole heart with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. There you see that multiple dimensional person, God calling to be able to glorify him. And you see this in Thessalonians. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And what does that look like? May your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. What makes a person a person is this mind, body, soul dynamic, okay? And this will be important as we go a little bit further on. One other way of not just looking at cancer or illness, the other thing is looking at grace. Which part of you, if you were going to say what a human being is, which part of you receives God's grace? In your baptism, was it just your body that was baptized? Was it your soul? Was it your whole person? How about when you're having communion and you're receiving the body and blood of Christ? Is it just your body that's eating and drinking? See, this is not, this is, these are things that we know and oftentimes take for granted and lose sight of when we're kind of all of a sudden thrust into some of these philosophical conversations. Um, but even Christ, as he talks about 
uh, this, uh, this reality of mind and body. He does so in profound ways, like when he talks about the importance of God's Word in Matthew 4. He says, man shall not live on bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. What's he talking about? He's talking about that you can't just live physically, but that there is a soul involved here that's fed by God's Word. So, your whole self God communes with and interacts with body, mind, and soul, and each one of those dimensions or parts God has created for His glory. Just like when you have the dry bones. This is one of my favorite stories in in Ezekiel, right? So, of course, we all know the story. Greg, you could probably stand up and sing the song, right? (laughs) But you could have those dry bones, right? And then they started rattling, right? And then you had the sinews and the flesh, and you had the physical part all came together. Is that where the story ends? You didn't know there was going to be a test, did you? What happens? The soldiers are there. They didn't have the breath of God. So Ezekiel's told by God to command the the winds to come and to enter, and their souls rejoin their bodies, right? And you have that beautiful moment. It's the same thing what we have when we go back to the Garden of Eden. You know, the birds, the the trees, all those things are spoken into existence. But mankind is, God has an intimate relationship with mankind where he reaches down into the clay and he, with his own hands, not just with his voice, not just declares it to be, but with his own hands shapes it and then breathes his own breath into mankind's lungs. And so the other thing I want to get into here, and I'll, I'll just say it now, is the same thing with, with Eve, right? We, we know the story of Eve, how God takes the side of Adam and takes her aside, or her, that, that side apart and goes and forge, forms Eve. The significance of Eve and her body is at that moment, not just when Adam sees her and gives her a name, but at the very beginning of God's intimate relationship with her. We'll get to that more. So, you could, we'll just move on to that one. So the eternal nature of woman. Are we ready? <laughs> All right. So I like to break these down into three different categories. Um, uh, this is a really helpful way, and I'll talk about it more. But the first, re, the first eternal nature is being a daughter. This is when I, when I refer to being a daughter as an eternal nature of woman, um, I'm referring to that individual's primary relationship to God. Second, bride. And this isn't what you might think it is. It's not just the fact that every woman needs to be married and can't be a woman unless she has a man in her life. That's not at all what this is saying. Quite the opposite. What the, this concept of being a bride in the eternal identity as a woman is her relationship to man and to the rest of, commu- uh, the, rest of the world. And then this concept of the eternal nature of a woman as a mother. So relationship to God, man, and future generations. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. First person. So now if we're on the worksheet, we're at Hannah. Um, and we're going to see um, Hannah as displaying for us the eternal nature of what it means to be a woman. We're going to look at Priscilla um, from the book of Acts as showing us the kind of what might be seen in the eternal nature of uh, being a wife. And then Deborah, good old Deborah from the Old Testament teaching us what it means to be a mother. So let's talk a little bit about women as daughter. So in First Samuel 2, most of the time, first of all, when you think of Hannah, you think of that prayer that she had at the temple steps where she's praying that she conceive and have a child and she's weeping and Eli thinks that she's, pray- or that she's drunk and all sorts of different stuff. But that's not, that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about first is where her heart is. So Hannah, this is her speaking. My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. Her baseline identity is not found in her relationship to her husband or even in the fact that she is uh, able to conceive and have a child. The very principal thing and what gives her the ability to to weather the storms in life, regardless of what those are, is the rock that's in her life. And that's the one who created her, 
who made her who she is and continues to sustain her in, in so many perils and, 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 and temptations and trials in this life. You know, one of the things that really struck me when I was doing some of this reading is, you know, there was a, a woman that I was walking out to the parking lot with and and she was talking to me about how she always parked underneath a street light because at night she never wanted to walk into an empty, dark parking lot. And I thought to myself, as a, as a man, I've never given that any thought. I've just lumbered in and out of buildings all over the time, you know. But there, her life, and I'm sure you guys are nodding your head, her life is, is constantly uh, feeling um, like... You know, completely different than a man's experience. And this dependence on, on safety and this primary relationship with God is seen different and experienced a lot differently. And we'll see that. Uh, so Penina, I, I always, that's the, the other wife of uh, Hannah's husband. Obviously she can have a child. She's making fun of Hannah all the time and ridiculing her. Um, she was, I refer to as the original, one of the original mean girls. Um, but what does she do? What does Hannah do as she's being uh, uh, harassed by this other woman, as she's being attacked by society? She runs to the rock and redeemer and relies on him for strength and encouragement. Just like, uh, uh, we were, like all women are called to do before anything else in their life, their principal relationship. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I ride on the wings of the morning and dwell on the uttermost part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me, your right hand shall hold me. Again, that woman that was telling me how scary it was for her to walk in the dark parking lot. And these are safe neighborhoods, right? And for me, you know, this, this, this verse speaks speaks to her in a, a different way than it might some other individuals. Again, just building on 139. I see, uh, or if I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night. Even darkness is, is not dark with you. The night is bright as day for darkness is as light with you. For you form my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. We're going to talk more about this tomorrow, but your biology matters. Your body matters because God knit you together, right? And whether it's used to conceive a child or not, God made you to be who you are. He knit you together. And divorcing who he created you to be with your identity is to rob you of a sacred, sacred gift. It's to rob, rob you of who you are as a whole person. So, that's woven into this text as well. Just because Psalm 139 is, just continues to unpack for us. I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in the secret, intricately woven in the, in the depths of the earth. And then you saw my unformed substance in your book were written uh, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O Lord. How vast the sum of them. Here's going to be some more specific things. Uh, Isaiah 43. But now, thus says the Lord, he who created you, he who formed you, fear not, I have redeemed you, I have called you by name. One of the things that I know, especially, you know, having sisters and raising teenage daughters and things, is a sense of identity and self-esteem that comes especially around puberty. F to have a God that not only created these women and these girls and you yourselves, but to know the intimate relationship that he has, that he knows your name and that, that, he, that he has you wrapped up in his arms is so important. Because in a world that will turn its back on you in a moment, relationships continue to end in, in, uh, in shatters and all these things, you have this immovable relationship with one who promises to be with you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you. And here's, I highlighted this one especially. How because you are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you. How powerful is that? 
to have that personal relationship as a daughter, to run to their father and to be greeted with this reality. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and from the west. I will gather you. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth. He won't forget you. Okay. Everyone who calls in my name, I have created for my glory, whom I formed and made. And then Isaiah 43, one of my favorite passages I am I I am he who blots out your transgressions for my sake and I will not and I will not remember your sins. You know there's a lot of things that uh, w- women deal with. This is me talking from a marriage and family counselor that are very unique uh, especially from societal pressures or cultural things when it comes to guilt and shame and here as a daughter a daughter of God, they can run to and hear the words specifically targeting the things that they are carrying as a woman and have it that personal absolution of having those things removed. Because God isn't just being general in these terms. The you there isn't, you know, like if you're down in Texas, y'all, right? It's you. The things that you're struggling with. And this is this is goes back to my conversation about that 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 taking the concept of her and she as a pronoun and replacing it with the they. It's taking these proclamations and this intimacy that God desires to have with an individual and removes it by just one step. And that step at times can feel like a million miles. So here you have uh, Mary acting like a daughter. Um, And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So having that concept of of not only a daughter, but uh, uh, in the fact that God is providing for and caring for, but having that relationship of service that she is, that uh, as a daughter, she's there to be part of the family and to continue to, to look to God for direction. All right, we're kind of moving by real fast because I don't want to, because you imagine doing this all in one night, right? So, so woman as bride, Priscilla. Priscilla and Aquila, the tent makers. I love this story um, because you have, uh, well, here, I'll just read it. So after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth and he found a Jew named Aquila and a native of Pontius recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. Because Claudius had commanded all the Jews leave Rome and he went to see them. And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked for they were tent makers by trade. And that's Acts 18. So, oh, yeah, we'll go back to this. So what's interesting about Priscilla is that she is mentioned way more times than her husband is. And uh, Priscilla, uh, you know, you think about a tent maker. I always like this imagery because there you have individuals separating out the different types of, of wool and, and, uh, and, and fabric and things like that. And then you have the individual that's there on, uh, um, on the loom and, and making all of the different things. Most importantly, they're tent makers, so they're making canvases that people will sleep under. Uh, so there's all sorts of beautiful imagery uh, that you could use for this. But I always go back to that room that they're in there making tents. I wonder which one of them would argue that they're the most important person. Do you think Aquila would be able to say, you couldn't do this without me? Or, or Priscilla saying, no, if, it was, if I was gone, the business would be wrecked. Right? You wouldn't have Annie's got her gun in this, in this conversation between Aquila and Priscilla. No, they work together collaboratively to be able to fasten together on this loom, this beautiful, pair, this beautiful garment that the world could sleep under as they worked in harmony with one another. And so when we look at the concept of woman as wife, it's not the fact that we're looking at, you know, in, women as being subordinate, um, and all, we'll get into all this in a little bit, or objectified. We're looking at this concept of woman as partner walking beside and, and doing all the things that men cannot do, right? And, and doing them in a way that brings harmony to all of creation. Uh, remember, it, it, we'll get into this in a minute. All right, so let's, I'll, I'll see what it's... Uh, 
what we got. So it says, Genesis 2, uh, then the Lord God said, it's not good that a man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Um, and the man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there wasn't found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs, closed it up in his flesh. And the rib that the, man, that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into woman and brought her to him. Then the woman said, This at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now, for you and I that are English readers, it really doesn't make that big of a difference. But that verse, 22, is the very first time Adam is called man in the Hebrew. Before that, he's always Adam. But at that moment, he is given the title man. So from a biblical standpoint, man doesn't even get his identity until women stand on the earth. Not only that, but this whole idea of woman flows from this concept of, of, uh, of this man, right? And we'll get to, and the two shall become flesh. Because the reuniting of God's creation for the, per, the, the, the purpose of uh, managing and facilitating creation and being God's image into the world is what it was designed to do. Or, yeah. So we'll come back to that text here in a little bit, but I just want to con- just kind of break it down. One of the things that people say when they read that, they have a knee-jerk reaction. They say, a helper? A woman's more than a helper, right? But let's see what God says about a helper. God says, but do you see for you note mischief and vexation that you may take into your hands? To you, the helpless commits himself. You have been the helper of the fatherless. He's, God, this is a description of God. God is a helper of the fatherless. Psalm 30, hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. O Lord, be my helper. Psalm 54, behold, God is my helper. The Lord is the upholder of my life. Psalm 118, the Lord is on my right side as my helper. I shall look and triumph on those who hate me. Hebrews 13, 6, so we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? John 14, This is Jesus speaking. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring you to remembrance all that I have said to you. So I I always ask the group, is it a bad thing to be a helper? Is it a second-class citizen to be a helper? Is it an afterthought to be a helper? No. So you hear a lot of times individuals holding that passage from Genesis 2.18 and saying, a helper, we're more than just an afterthought. In fact, that's the whole reason why Simone de Beauvoir got really upset because she argued that there really, really wasn't two sexes at all. There was only one. There was man and other. And women were just given into this other category and pointed to some of this use of these words from, uh, from Genesis 2 as seeing, saying, we're, or, or saying, see, all we're supposed to be is helpers. And forgetting and missing the whole point that God himself wraps up his identity as a helper. And that's exactly what is seen when you bear God's image into the world. Walking beside the rest of humanity and bearing its burdens. You are taking the sacred mantle of what it means to be a woman. And you're filling that role as being the eternal bride. Now, a lot of times, I always jump this in there. Now, this is Ephesians 5 because it talks about wives, and it talks about wives submit to one another, right? And this is the most common passage by every uh, bride-to-be that asks, can you please not put this in my wedding, right? And so I put it in the wedding. No. <laughs> but, um, but let me tell you, this is a real misconception of the word submit. When we think of the word submit, what do you guys think of? Just throw out a couple things. Bondage, okay. Actually, yeah, well, (laughs) huh? Subservant, good. What are some other words? What are some synonyms that you think that you've been taught or or equate to the word submit? Give in to, to, oppress, those types. It's It's an oppressive term. Well, let's actually take a look at what are some of the antonyms and synonyms of the word submit. And you guys tell me after we do this little exercise if you want submission as a part of your marriage, okay? 
agree. This is a synonym. An antonym, resist, oppose, concur, defy, defer. For those of you who have married, have you ever deferred to your spouse? Is that a, is that a show of weakness? No, sometimes it's wisdom, right? <laughs> Go ask your mother, right? All right. Frustrate, acknowledge, battle or fight, abide, humble, pride. You want submission in your marriage? In the true essence of what the world means? Or do you want what's opposite of submit? Do you want, do you want your, rela- your relationship with your husband to be defined as defying, opposing, resisting, fighting, frustrating, and prideful? I mean, as a marriage and family counselor, I would tell you that this side over here is probably not your, you know, it's top 10 that you want to be, you know, described as, right? But here you can see the health of it. Because the word actually means to be, to be in a right relationship with, to be in order. That's what this word means in submit. And actually what Paul's describing during this time, he's using military language. And, and it can be argued that what he's actually talking about and using this imagery because he moves right into the armor of God's story with Ephesians, he's talking about two soldiers, how they submit to each other on the battlefield and how they willingly give each other's life up. And, if you, and, in, and in order to get to Gen, or Ephesians 5.23, where it talks about women, you need to submit to, to your husbands, you would have to gloss all, oh, just right over verse 21, that it says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. But the world has grabbed onto this word and corrupted it in such a way that now people reel at, the, at just the sound of it And Christian women don't want it as part of their wedding because we've lost sight of what the word actually means. And at the end of the day, when you actually keep reading in Ephesians, after wives submit to your husbands, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by washing of water in the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy without blemish. In the, in the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves himself loves his, or loves his wife. So no one who, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of this body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. And I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. I mean, as you read through the rest of the text, you wrap your mind around what Paul's talking about here. In no way is he telling husbands to oppress your wives, right? And then, like I said, you'd have to walk right over Ephesians 5.21, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And again, it's being in that proper relationship, right? Um, and this is this unknown quote. I kind of alluded to it earlier, but women weren't created to do everything better than men, like Annie's got her gun. No, they were created to do everything men can't, which, ladies, is a huge list. A lot of job security in that one. And again, like I was talking about before, this is that passage that I was telling you uh, from uh, Genesis 2. Then the man, Adam, first time he's, uh, or so you have Adam, right? Um, said, this is at last bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, Ishaha, because she was taken out of man, Ish. It's the first time those words are used in, to define husband and wife, man and woman. One person asked me, leading up uh, to a, a presentation I was taking, when does God, Scripture ever refer to gender? This is the first time. Because here we're not just talking about different people's names. We're talking about the whole identity of who they are. And it has completely changed. And the role of woman, when Eve was formed, and and, uh, from 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 her being brought forth by God as his daughter, that changed all of creation, even man. So... 
This is my favorite one. Woman is mother. So we get the judge, right? So Deborah. Deborah, as she is, if you read through the story in uh, Judges 5, uh, all the leaders aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. People are, are, are worried. They're fearful. They're not wanting to go to war. So what does Deborah do? She rises up, and she leads the people of Israel. And so and, and part of this, as she goes in and she defeats this foreign army, she sings this song in Judges 5. The villagers cease in Israel. They cease to be until I arose. I, Deborah, arose as a mother in Israel. You know what's neat about this? She doesn't have any kids. What is she talking about? Why is she calling herself a mother? It's because oftentimes we associate motherhood and being that concept of being, filling that role of eternal motherhood with, with vaginal birth. But you know this, that motherly heart and instinct exists apart from that altogether. And Deborah is singing this because she cared for Israel as a mother. Right? You even have Jesus talking about the same kind of sentiment as he looks over at uh, Jerusalem and how he says, Oh, I long, how I long to gather you as a mother hen would gather her chicks. This role in the eternal nature and identity of a mother is unique. And uh, Deborah is uh, uh, profoundly demonstrating this. Not as a, I mean, you go back to that silly stereotype thing or that litmus test where you go in and they ask you questions about whether or not you're a Barbie or a, or a G.I. Joe. What would they say about Deborah? Right? You know, there's a lot of people, you know, as we're getting into this, would argue that some of this trans ideology stuff would be arguing that she was, you know, really needed to identify as something else. But in fact, no, she recognizes and sees her role in the life of God's people as a mother. The other thing is, remember back when Eve got her name? How many kids did she have at the time? None. None. She didn't have a single child, but yet her name, Eve, was given to her because she would be the mother of all the living. This is, this, this is one of those things where this mystery is profound, right? Echoing Paul from Ephesians 5. But it gives us pause to reflect on these eternal natures of what it means to be a woman. And how this role of being a woman is much more than an impulse, an emotion, a fleeting thought, or, or a societal expectation. But it's something that God really woven into the fabric of his creation. And even so much so that when he forged man, there should have been a thunderbolt that, that strikes us as we read through Genesis. Because everything's good. The sea, the, the trees, the birds, the livestock. But when man's created... Everything comes to a grinding halt because everything's good, everything's good, and then it's, and it's not good that man be alone. And then when Eve is created, it's really good. Finally, creation is whole. And as we look at this eternal nature and the significant role that women play, not just in a physical identity, but as a whole person, mind, body, and soul, we see it as something Majestic and sacred. Right? All right. <clears throat> and here we have another passage where even God uses this imagery of motherhood to describe his compassion and his faithfulness. Can a woman forget her nursing child that she could have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. As one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you. You shall be comforted in Jerusalem. God using this part of his image and showing how the, the feminine and the women identity is wrapped up in that great proclamation, or in that great commission of be, being an image bearer in his world. And again, when, even if you look at the fourth commandment, right, it doesn't say, children, obey your father. Children, obey all your masculine authorities. Children, all, all, obey all this stuff. It says, honor your father and your mother, because a father and a mother together bear the authority, principal authority of God 
the primary authority, the first authority of God in creation. So, and if you don't, and this is something I wish we could get every child to understand, if you don't obey your mother, it won't go well with you in the land. Right? So, all right. And again, just some of the other things that you have uh, when you talk about, you know, a lot of times you, there was a big movement, I don't know, it still is pretty popular, that's uh, the Proverbs 31 women, all right? Um, but when you get down to the bottom of Proverbs 31, what really is it that, that highlights womanhood? Well, when you get to verse 28, it says, her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, as he praises her, many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Here you have all three natures. You have mother, you have wife, and you have daughter. And all of those things work together. That is what's to be praised. Because in reality, charm is deceitful, right? Anybody can be nice for a while. And beauty, it comes and goes, right? But this, being a mom, having that eternal identity of motherly love and compassion towards creation, uh, being a husband, um, or being a husband, being a wife, and uh, having that relationship like Priscilla had with Aquila, working together to provide for humanity, and then uh, that principle one. Um, I do, I, you know, I, I skipped over this thought in my head. You know, when I was down in St. Louis, Sarah and I, we had a really good friend. Her name was Sarah Blackman, and she lived in North St. Louis, and um, she always joked because, you know, in those uh, North St. Louis inner city areas, you know, you, you had all these kids that were running around all the time. She described herself as a mom of the neighborhood. She watched over all those kids, and she didn't have any kids of her own. And when you think of an individual like that, you see what is, we're talking about with this eternal nature of womanhood. And I don't know, maybe you guys had that same kind of concept growing up. Maybe you had friends or neighbors and things like that, that you went into their house and they came over and all this other stuff. And everybody saw each other as having these types of roles and relationships. This is just gives evidence to how we recognize and realize these realities. All I'm doing tonight is just kind of putting it into a biblical framework for you. This guy is named, uh, his last name is Pina. He's an Astro, um, a Houston Astro. He, he, he hits a lot of home runs. Well, well, every time he rounds the base, he does that as he's coming into home. Now, some girls think he's cute. So when he was interviewed after one of the games, he hit a whole bunch of home runs. Uh, the, uh, the, the lady that was interviewing him said, so who's the special lady that got the heart as you rounded uh, third and came into home today? And he said, my mom. And that, that right there for me, again, this eternal nature of motherhood. Moms, and you know why we're talking about biological, adoptive, we're talking about cultural, community mo mothers, uh, has a huge significance. So a mother's love, right? You know, it's not a biological thing. It's not just something that's wrapped up in vaginal birth. So you have woman as mother. Um, and again, Deborah, I rose up, and you can see what she's talking about. I rose up as a mother in Israel. So just to recap, does that mean if you don't have a father or you're not married or you haven't given birth that you're not a real woman? Of course not, right? Because these aren't stereotypes. What I'm talking about is not being stereotypical. What I'm talking about is the sources of true identity, eternal identity wrapped up in God's creative order. Okay, how'd I do? Oh, holy moly, it is 725. That is amazing. So I was going pretty quick trying to keep it under that 90 minutes, and I can't believe it actually happened. Thank you guys for your patience. I, I, I hope I didn't lose you too much in some of the, the minutia and stuff like that. So tonight, like I said, was that, that, uh, that biblical perspective, taking a look at what we see when we look at the eternal nature of womanhood and how that eternal nature of womanhood is, yes, experienced, but also taught in the framework of God's creative order and how significant that is and how the answer to the question, what is a woman, is not something flippant. 
or something trivial, but something divine, and that needs to be cultivated and cherished. So does anybody have any questions? I'll open it up. Really? No questions? Okay. Um, as you think about questions, um, if there is somebody that has questions, please make sure you stop by and get one of the surveys on the way out. There's a basket on the table out there, and that's what that's for. It's for your surveys. Um, if you could fill those out, take some time um, and drop those off. Uh, we'll be doing those surveys both tonight and tomorrow night. I use those surveys to kind of hone my presentations and topics and do further research uh, on, on the issue. Uh, so please be sure to ask questions and things like that. And, um, of course, there's no place for your name, so, you know, unless you want to put your name on it. But I can't believe no one has any questions. Yes. All right. Finally. <laughs> Gender dysphoria. Gender dysphoria. That's what you're going to learn tomorrow night. Okay. So... There you go. Gender, gender dysphoria is a mental health condition, um, and the identi- what it actually is has evolved um, just recently over the last 20 to 30 years uh, from where it's categorized in mental health, um, and it's a condition in which individuals have extreme and persistent dysfunction and discomfort about their own physical body, okay? So a lot of times... We'll talk about individuals that are transgender and they feel like they want to be the other gender. That's not necessarily gender dysphoric, right? Because gender dysphoric is individuals that have serious uh, uh, um, distress about their own bodies. And this is significant, especially when you're talking to pubescent girls, because I haven't met, and even when I do these presentations in different parts of the state, I ask for a show of hands, how many women loved going through puberty, right? No one yet has raised their hand, right? And it's because puberty for girls, obviously, I don't need to talk about what that's like, but, you know, the thing is, is, is there ever a time where you are d- uncomfortable or dislike your physical body as a woman? So if we're going to start categorizing and diagnosing individuals as being gender dysphoric based on their some... Uh, some less clinical definitions, then we're going to run into some issues, right? And so, and that's some of the things that we'll talk about tomorrow too, is the importance of clinicians. Because a lot of times we've been talking about, you know, prevalence and what actual prevalence is versus what people identify as. Because it's so important, and I think this has been a, a, a horrible shift in the way that we see uh, society is now there are no authorities, you know, a psychiatrist, a psychologist, an MSW, individuals who are licensed, board certified, and, and capable and experienced to be able to, discover, to, to explore some of these really uh, mental health issues cannot be stripped of that responsibility and given to individuals who just want to reduce it to a fleeting motion. These, are, these mental health conditions are based on, you know, clinical observations over time of distress and discomfort, and that needs to stay in a professional setting. But you have individuals um, that, that talk about trans women. Um, um, I can't remember the name of the one that, that comes to mind. She, he wrote the, the book called The Whipping Girl, and, oh, it was almost there. But... Um, and, and in there, he talks about only he actually knows what it be, means to be a woman and that no psychologist or professor or, or person of expertise or authority can tell him because he alone defines what it means to be a woman and he knows what it means to be a woman so nobody outside of him can inform him. Imagine if you did that with cancer or diabetes or anything else in all of creation, Right? We don't do that. We shouldn't do that with mental health. And that's a dangerous road to go down. So, so you'll learn a lot about that tomorrow, hopefully. So, Any other questions? Yes? More a comment, but I've heard it said that we're not assigned at birth, but we're created at conception. Mm-hmm. From the moment of conception, yes. yeah. only male or female. 
Mm -hmm. and, and so that argument we'll talk about tomorrow too, especially when we get into intersex, because that's really where a lot of people have started. So if you've been conceived as a male or female, what about those individuals who have ambiguous genitalia or might have an XXY chromosome and things like that? And we'll talk about how we approach that as Christians um, and, and how we approach that uh, from a biblical uh, worldview and how it doesn't, it doesn't mean that there's a third gender or that there's gender fluidity, right? It, it actually reinforces the binary because you're, you're, you're operating within, well, which one of these two categories? It doesn't mean that there's a third one opening up. So we'll talk more about that tomorrow. It, it is. Um, actually, it's like 1.7% of the population. So they equate it to the population that has red hair, which is pretty similar. So, uh, but the problem is, is that that's conjuncture because most people that have some sort of inter, intersex, uh, uh, intersex condition, I guess if you want to call it that, don't even know it. Because most of the time, they lead to go on perfectly normal lives. They can conceive and have children or they can uh, have, you know, uh, be semen producers or whatever you want to call it. They can do all those things and they wouldn't otherwise notice. The reality of why they, 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 they estimate 1.7% is because of the studies that they've done over the last 30 to 40 years on Olympic games. Because it used to be, I'll talk about it tomorrow, you're getting too much into, out of me, but... <laughs> But yeah, so but the prevalence of inter and see the thing is, as you'll see, that the prevalence of intersex conditions does not in any way, shape, or form coincide with transgenderism at all. They would like it to. The, I, the people that are pushing this ideology and the, this ideology demands that it does, but individuals especially who have intersex conditions, they don't see themselves as part of this population or related to this uh, ideology at all. And we'll talk about why that is. So, any other questions? Maybe you'll look at this tomorrow, but so much of how we are yeah. is what we learn at home. Yeah. So much mm -hmm. good or bad. Yep. Yeah. That we pick up on that and that we think we need that how we need to live and act. Yep. And being able to, so the, what she was saying is so much of who we, uh, who we figured out who we are as women, we learned from home. And that's true. And it's true for men too. And it's actually not just a, a gender thing. It's who we are as individuals. You know, we do premarital counseling. We go into your family of origin and how you learn to be a parent and how that's going to, how you're going to rub heads together and how it's, you know, all this other stuff. But the thing is, is being able to, to divide the difference between what you learned and what God says. Because there's going to be, no matter how good your family is, there's going to be some stuff, right? But yet God's word stands, and this is what it means. And so, and this is why you have the difference, why you can be a woman in, in Russia, a woman in uh, Kuwait, a woman in Japan, and a woman in the Bronx, have all cultural differences, yet your identity as being a daughter a mother and a bride wrapped up in God's autonomy stay because the world will do a lot of weird things to the identity of womanhood and the world has done a lot of weird things to what it means to be a man even through lived experiences so that's why we need to go back to that one slide that says God is the holder of truth right so and this is why you know someone was telling me never mind we'll just we'll, they were saying that when they were growing up, they didn't get to wear pants unless it was Fridays or something like that when they were women, right? Yeah, and that, was, and that really impacted them. The reason why that, brought, that got brought up is because it's so cold out today, and they remember walking to and from school with, with dresses on. But anyways, <clears throat> but uh, there's nothing in Scripture that says you can only wear pants on Fridays. Right? <laughs> All right, any other questions before we get started? I'll kind of meander afterwards if you want to ask. Um, and then, like I said, please make sure you grab one of those surveys, fill it out, put it in the basket, and then hopefully I get to see you guys tomorrow. Why don't we close in prayer? 
Lord, we thank you for today, for this conversation, for the gift that your word really is, that we get to run to it every time, not just this time, but every time there's confusion, every time there's uh, chaos, and see its immovable presence and guidance and light in our life. And we ask that as we leave here, as we contemplate the things that were discussed, you continue to use your word to to navigate us uh, through this issue and be with us as we return here tomorrow evening. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning or af- evening, <laughs> seven o'clock or six, five, I don't know. Let's just, let's just, that's a great way to start, isn't it? <clears throat> Goes better from point, yeah, this point forward. So today obviously is our second session. Last night we went through a lot of the history of gender studies, uh, feminism, even in the 20th century. Uh, we discussed the eternal nature of woman being represented uh, in that identity of being a daughter, being a a wife, and being a mother. Um, And uh, today we're going to be moving now into a lot of the conversation and controversy that we see around in our in our culture uh, surrounding gender dysphoria, transvestitism, even drag queens and kings, and what that looks like, why we and how we can understand it, and most importantly, we'll be wrapping up with how we can approach these circumstances um, according to our Christian calling. But before we get into that, like I said, I just want to recap some of the things about what this Bible study is not. It's not transphobic, right? Just because we're talking about these things and using these terms isn't because we're scared of them. In fact, it's quite the opposite, right? Being able to use these things is, uh, continues to give us a little bit more comfort being able to talk about them and, and express uh, some of the concerns and the needs associated with these things. It's not misogynistic, right? It's not, I understand that I'm a white male standing in front of you talking about what it means to be a woman, but it's not because I'm trying to force that kind of uh, that concept on you. It's not fear-based in any way. It's definitely not political. Again, like I said, it's interesting how the world constantly tries to take these controversial issues out of the church and say, oh, those are strictly political things, and they absolutely are not. This has to do with core identity of who we are and what God has created us to be. And it's not about hate um, at all. It's simply about truth. And not only that, but it's about speaking the truth, and this is this will be highlighted towards the end of our talk about talk tonight, is speaking truth in love, right? And how do we do that? How do we approach the situation, the individuals that we know and care about that are struggling with this, and speak truth and love at the same time with them? But before we get any further, why don't we open up with prayer? <clears throat> Lord, we thank you for tonight, uh, for this chance that you've given us to be able to come together, the ability to explore difficult, uh, difficult topics, but to see just the beauty of your word as it stands immovable, as it stands uh, constant in our lives, uh, regardless of what we find ourselves confronted with, and speaks to some of our deepest needs. And we ask that you bless us as we explore this. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so the reason why I wanted to uh, start talking about uh, terminology and all this stuff is because it seems like every time you turn around the terms and the vocabulary associated with a lot of what we're talking about, even last night, it seems like those definitions are so fluid and, and they change almost on a, on a daily basis. I started working on this about a year, a little over a year ago, about a year and a half ago, and even the stuff that I was writing a year and a half ago, the terminology has changed so much. Some of the authors and the writers that have been writing these books about how we can approach, approach uh, uh, trans ideology and philosophy, they're republishing books just a couple years after they write their first volume. And it's not like what you got when you were a textbook where they just change like where the periods are or, or maybe one or two words. They're having to rewrite chapters just because of the words and the definitions and how these words are being used, how they change. And it reminds me of a quote from uh, George Orwell in 1984, that book that uh, we used to always have to read, but it says, there is no swifter route to the corruption of thought 
than through the corruption of language. And this is one of the most, I think, important things as we make our way into this discussion is being able to define terms and hold on to those definitions because only then can we actually interact with each other and help those people that are struggling and fully understand it. Um, and so it's not uncommon at all when we get into these conversations for, for words to start taking different shapes and everything. So we're really going to try to hold, uh, hold words to a simple definition. Uh, last night, I showed you just what trans uh, identity actually encompasses. A lot of times, we think of just the one that's about halfway down on this first column, the FTM and MTF. That's uh, female to male or male to female. And, and that's what we immediately associate with. But, in it, but there has been this umbrella term now, this trans ideology or a transgender individual that covers so many from a gender, that's meaning they don't have an gender. Androgynous means that they don't choose to live as though they have a gender, that there's nothing about them that makes them feel one way or another. Bi gender, they're both genders at the same time. Cis, that's the one that you are, you are, you express yourself gender wise and um, have the same as the same as your biological sex. FTM, like I said, female to male, male to female. There is so many different things that are associated with this. We could be here for the next hour and a half simply just talking about these definitions. But the whole point of why I wanted to just show this slide is to show you how many designations are in here. So when you go back to what we talked about last night, when you look at our kids in the classrooms and in the education systems in the Western world being uh, taught how to use that gender bread diagram, it's not as simple as you might think. It is all of these types of things that, uh, uh, that are being opened up for uh, uh, kids, adults alike, to be able to, um, to be confused in how they express themselves versus their biological reality. <clears throat> so the one thing that I want to talk about is that, you know, just be able to provide some simple understanding about some of the most common things. You know, oftentimes when we think of transgender, we think of a, a transvestite. It used to be a lot simpler, I guess, in your, in your mind mentality. Well, it's not as simple, like I said, as you might think. Transvestite or transvestitism is actually a paraphilic disorder. It's something that is diagnosable. It's a clinical condition. And it's defi defined this way. So it's an intense ar sexual arousal from cross-dressing brought on by the actual stimulus of the clothing or thoughts or pictures of one in female clothing. Like I said, this is a paraphilic disorder. So what's important about this one is, is it's not just the fact that someone feels like they're a woman or that they express themselves outwardly as a woman because they feel like that's the, the gender that they are inside. This is a sexual disorder where the individuals are putting on female clothing or holding on to pictures of themselves dressed as females for sexual arousal. When we talk about um, transvestites, you know, reading to children and things like that, right, often, and we'll talk about dr the difference between transvestites and drag king and queens here in a little bit, we want to make sure that this is not happening. Because the reason why they're clothed the way they are is because of sexual stimulus, right? It's, and don't, don't confuse that as anything else, okay? And this isn't just my wording. This is um, the DSM-5's literal clinical definition of this paraphilic disorder. So this, this is an intense and persistent sex, sexual interest, right? Um, and, uh, and, and that's one thing that you're going to, to be exposed to tonight as we make our way through some of these other conditions, gender dysphoria alike, is that these are intense and persistent. There's a lot of terminology that really has to be held on to here. These are not fleeting moments. They're not just, just short bursts of, of interest or compulsion. This is intense and persistent dysfunction, and, um, and we'll see that even more as time goes on. Drag queens, right, or drag kings. This is a, a, a picture from... Um, uh, Birdcage, that movie from the 90s. I think it was from the 90s anyways. And you have those individuals there down in Florida and they're on the stage and these are men dressed as women. Dra drag kings and queens, these individuals dress in, other, uh, in their other gender or opposite gender clothing to, for, for entertainment value, 
right? And so they're doing it as part of a show. There's not necessarily that intense sexual stimulation that you have going on. Now, you could be a drag king and queen and be uh, heterosexual or homosexual or bisexual or all these different things, but there is a very distinct difference between a drag king and queen and a transvestite, right? And so there's clear uh, differences in those types of things. But what most oftentimes when we're talking about trans ideology or individuals that are trans, um, oftentimes we're talking about individuals that suffer from something called gender dysphoria. And that's probably a term that you never knew five years ago, but probably have heard constantly or at least several times over the last year. And again, this is, this is a very rare and very intense uh, mental health condition. One that uh, oftentimes takes years to diagnose. Uh, even in the UK, there's regulations saying that it has to be observed over the course of two years by two uh, uh, psychiatrists um, and that can continue to sign off on these individuals that are experiencing this intense uh, uh, and persistent dysfunction and disorder. So this is what it's de described as. So an individual who suffers from gender dysphoria are individuals who experience, the, or experience a strong incongruence with their natal gender and their expressed gender. This can manifest in a strong dislike for their natal genitalia or desire to possess the primary or secondary genita genitalia of the other person, or of, a diff of the other sex. So the big words that I want you to hold on to are persistent and severe and dysfunction and discomfort. These words that are used are not individuals that are celebrating this particular thing that they're struggling with. Individuals who struggle with gender dysphoria wish they would never have it. Because can you imagine looking at your body and, and absolutely every day just, just being disgusted by your genitalia and the fact that you wish you could be the other sex. This isn't something that uh, is... is, is uh, it's not something that, that an individual desires at all. Um, so that, that word dysphoria right there is something that should really bring a lot of empathy into our hearts and minds because these individuals are suffering. They're struggling and they want help, okay? So uh, individuals with gender dysphoria are not, this, are not given transvetic diagnosis unless the criteria for those gender or transvetic are co-occurring with uh, gender dysphoria. So those are two separate different disorders. So an individual who might be suffering uh, from transvetic disorder is not automatically gender dysphoric and a person who's gender dysphoric is not automatically a transvestite, right? And this, is, this, this might seem uh, confusing or it might seem like we're, get, we're drilling down or getting a little bit more specific on these types of things, but this is just highlighting how critical it is that we continue to, to rely on uh, prof professionals and experts in this field. It's really interesting to me anyways that we have individuals that are not specialized in this type of thing leading young children and allowing young children to self-diagnose some of these issues when, like I said, this is something very severe and very rare at the same time. So again, I just like I just keep doubling down on these words. So it's a de it's a demonstrable distress or dysfunction because of these systems and or symptoms in the life of a person, and it must be present for the person to be diagnosed as a, having a mental health condition. What we have started seeing as individuals go in, like I said, there's psychologists, psychiatrists, MSWs, those things that are doing this type of screening, and they're trying to figure out ways to continue to keep. Uh, keep that, that screening process honest as individuals have started to learn now that they're screening for particular symptoms and so going in to, to manifest these distinct characteristics of distress and dysfunction. And um, in fact, there's a lot of interviews. Julia Serrano, that was the, the trans man that, or trans woman that I was talking about yesterday that wrote that book, Whooping, Whipping Girl. And in that book, he talks about how his friends go into these uh, psychiat uh, psychiatric meetings and they intentionally go way over the top so that they can continue to, to have these uh, diagnoses. 
Here's the, the interesting thing about gender dysphoria and a lot of uh, even paraphilic disorders, but here's the prognosis. That means what's, what's, what's the probability that this is going to resolve, right? 67 to 90 percent of the time, and it's weighted heavily towards the 90 percent, self-correct post-puberty. This is a, a really important statistic as we go into the treatments for these things. So when we're talking about gender dysphoria, not only is it a rare condition, but it self-corrects, and the process that self-corrects it is puberty. So here is your prevalence. So gender dysphoric, right? This is out of the DSM-5 diagnostic manual for or, or, diagnostic manual for mental illness. Um, for males, people that were born male, um, it's about one in 20,000 individuals. For females, uh, it's one in 50,000 individuals. Uh, so in Grand Rapids, in our school system, we have a student body of about 4,000, a little more. So that means that we could statistically have at least 0.2, so two-tenths of one person that represents this population. Okay. The reason why this frustrates me an awful lot, and we'll get to this in a little bit, is some of the prevalence that we have in other, uh, other mental health problems in our school system, but we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Here is one of them. So over the last couple of years, the Department of Health in Minnesota has started surveying children, and there was a survey that went out into ISD 318 and surveyed kids to see their emotional, mental, and behavioral health. This is their self-reporting, and this is anonymous. So 11th graders, 80% of 11th graders in our school system said that they uh, have, have experienced suicidal ideation, thought about killing themselves. One in 10 of our kids in ninth grade report attempting suicide. One in three eighth graders have long-term mental health, behavioral, and emotional problems. Half of our eighth graders struggle with depression. Three in four struggle with anxiety. 80% of our kids in eighth grade say that they routinely think about the purpose of their life. These, these numbers that came out of this, this Department of Health a survey had jaws on the floor because they thought that there would be an issue, especially coming out of COVID. They had no concept of what the mental health of our kids actually is. And this, I think, should be helpful for us when we look at some of the behavioral issues that we see around. You know, we talk about kids and things like that and uh, the, the decisions that they're making and things. This is the, the, the state of, uh, of our high school and middle schoolers. And so the reason why I bring that up is because if you look at what the real struggles are, the real struggles in, in our community, in our society, our dealing, deals, uh, our, 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 our struggles with depression and anxiety, suicidal ideation, and identity. No wonder we see this thing that's, oh, no, I have a different slide. No wonder that we see this thing called rapid onset gender dysphoria, and we'll talk about that later, where all of a sudden you start seeing these young individuals who are struggling with these, uh, with these symptoms start gravitating towards uh, this popular thing that's starting to move around our culture. So this will be important as we come back. So a lot of you guys were asking me, and even uh, tonight, talking about, well, what about individuals who are born with both sex, secondary sex characteristics, like, you know, both have male and female genitalia, or maybe female genitalia on the outside, male uh, sex organs on the inside. Uh, a few years back, we call these individuals hermaphrodites. That, that's a, not kind of a passe term now, and the term that is used now is intersex. The possibility of you being born with some sort of genetic variation based on your gender is about 1.7%. It's about the same as being born with red hair. The difference, though, 
Um, and, and, the re- and that's that, that 1.7 percent is only a guess because there's no way for us to really know how many individuals have this uh, have this uh, chromosomal abnormality. And the reason is, is because most people, like I said last night, they don't know they have it because they continue to carry on and function just as they would if, if they didn't know it at all. And most individuals who suffer from intersex conditions, they about 99 percent of the time always align themselves with the sex that was discovered at birth. So a lot of times when you talk about people that, are, that, that focus in on trans ideology and talk about transgender, they bring up this group and they say, see, this is example of how we exist outside the binary or example of, of how there's something different than male or female or something like a third gender. But understand that there is no such thing as a third gender, even when you're talking about intersex populations, because they either have male external genitalia and female internal genera- uh, genitalia, or the other way around. It's not a, it's, there is not a third aspect to this. There's still only two. And, um, and it's really interesting to me that, they, that oftentimes this statistic is brought up. The only reason why we know that these individuals, uh, because the, the visible the people that are born with visible uh, uh, both genitalia, that is a very low number. A lot of this is chromosomal, this 1.7%. And the only reason why we know this is because of the Olympic Games. Throughout, uh, throughout the, the late part of the 20th century, uh, there started to be a shift in female, uh, female sporting events. It, before, I think it was in, before the 60s, 60s and before, women competitors would have to stand naked in front of judges to be inspected to make sure that they were actual females so that they could participate in sporting events. Well, you could understand that that was intrusive and not really liked by a lot of individuals. So as the decades roll on, they continued to find new ways to do this. So the way that they wanted to make sure that women were competing against women is now doing spit swabs and things like that, testing their chromosomes and making sure that there was two X's, not an X and a Y. During that process, they realized that a lot of elite female athletes had a unique intersex trait, and it was the fact that they had a little bit more testosterone um, in their development. And when we're talking about a little bit more, we're talking about fractions. You know, it's interesting when we talk about testosterone levels between men and women, and when they talk about, you know, about being able to, to do hormone therapies. We'll get to more of that in a little bit. Um, but that's one of the reasons why we have these statistics is because of the Olympic Games and being able to preserve the sanctity of female athletic co- competitions. Right? But these individuals, they do not recognize themselves as part of the, uh, the trans community. In fact, this book, the inner, the, this book is called The Comprehensive Guide to Intersex. It gives you all the different types of intersex conditions, what they look like, how they're treated, all these different things. It says that intersex traits are physical, anatomical, and biological, and are formed in the womb. Intersex traits are not core gender identity, whom you are attracted to, or how you express yourself. Gen- intersex is not related to the act of sex. Intersex is not a mental illness. Intersex is not abnormal. Intersex is not the same as transgender. I don't think they could be any more clear. Stop associating us with this movement. So you have a lot of individuals juggling all these different things up in the air. You know, they're searching for their personhood. They're, they're exploring this concept of transgenderism. They're looking at, at possible diagnosis of gender dysphoria and, and all these huge lists of emerging sexual identities. But remember, intersex is not part of this conversation. Right? Not part of it at all. So a lot of times when you're talking to individuals that, are, that uh, maybe might know somebody who's transgender or maybe had a conversation with them, read an article, you'll hear them say, gender is not a choice. Now that can mean a couple different things. But I do want to preface the next part of this conversation with saying that a big part of the transgender movement is, in fact, that people have a choice. Remember that uh, Emma Watts, that, or is it Watson, that made that statement last night that I, that I quoted her on saying, I don't want anybody to tell me who I can be or make choices for me. That's a huge part of this, right? this, be, this ability to be autonomous. 
But some individuals will say, I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not, I, I wasn't, I, I didn't choose to be transgender. I was born this way. That's what's going to guide our conversation next. <clears throat> When we look at transgenderism or we look at male and female, it's not simply uh, an emotion, it's not a fleeting thought, it's not a compulsion. When you look at the difference between our, our anatomy, our physiology, our neurology, there are extreme differences. I know that we always joke about that book that you know men are from Mars and women are from Venus and these types of things. And there's a whole lot of different self-help books out there about communicating between men and women. But you don't have to have a conversation between and, and witness a conversation between a man and a woman for very long before you realize that there is some, some help that's needed to be able to bridge this. And it's because how our thoughts are actually organized, what parts of our brain are being utilized and how we continue to communicate. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But when we relate to biology, it's very simple. You know, I remember when you would get to class, you know, and there would be that, that uh, the, the projector, you know, with, the, with everything ready to go and you were excited because you were going to have a movie that day, you know, and you weren't going to have to deal with biology class and then they turned it on and it was the sex ed whatever, you know, and talking about uh, male and female anatomy and you tried to, you know, go to the bathroom as soon as possible so you didn't have to be in the classroom, you know. Um, but back in those days, it was so simple. If you were a man, you had an XY46 chromosome. If, if, you had, uh, if you were a female, you were an XX. And even then, they were talking about XXY and all these different types of intersex possibilities. But yet, there isn't a, a, you know, a Z. There isn't a third gender. And, and these, uh, these traits, female and male, they're, they're biological. And it's not a philosophy. It's not an, ideal, an ideology. It is hard fact, scientifically proven. And what I think is really, really interesting is that, now I'm not going to move into any sort of political stuff, but point out the irony of a lot of different things where you have individuals constantly pointing to the science over the last however many years, whether it's talking about health care or whether it's talking about environmental regulations, everything. Look to the science except for transgender ideology. That's the only place that that conversation completely dries up. Because when you look at the science, starting first with biology, there's two genders. And there's a very distinct thing that happens at conception. Because when you're at conception, your hormones and your ability to receive and process those hormones com completely changes your anatomy moving forward, especially how your brain uh, is developed. And that goes into this next thing about neurology. It's interesting, there is a, a philosopher... Uh, that started studying the difference between ba brain chemistry between men and women. And the reason why she started studying it was because she was being told that there was this ceiling or at least this barrier not allowing women to get into STEM programs, you know, science, engineering, math, and technology. And, uh, and so she was trying to figure out what it is that's going on. If it is truly, a neuro it, maybe it's a neurological thing, or what is it that women aren't applying for these, uh, these jobs or these majors? And what she t found out is that as you look at the way that the, the female brain and her neurology, neurology works, is that it, it actually crosses right and left hemispheres a lot more than men. Women are, have more capability of doing a lot of different things at the same time. And men are very focused, right? And a lot of times when women will score really high up in the engineering, math, and technology aptitude tests, they also score really high in the literary and uh, literary arts in that part too. And so what she saw and what she was able to determine was that the reason why women aren't in these fields is because they don't want to be in these fields, Imagine that, ladies. You, you get to choose and you make choices. And so then she talks about how all these different male-run institutions, universities, are trying to get women into these fields and how it's actually coercing them and making them do something they didn't want to do in the first place because they'd rather do things with, langu with uh, language arts and literary arts and things like that because they're able to score higher in, in these types of things. That is virtually not found in the male gender. If males 
uh, score really high in um, math and engineering and technology and those types of things, they do not score high in the interpersonal uh, and literary arts, that kind of stuff, right? It, oh, and, and vice versa. I'm living proof of that, right? I, I talk all the time, right? But I can't balance a checkbook. And, and that's that kind of, uh, kind of concept. And so when we look at how we're wired even, our neurology, it's completely different, right? So as you look at, um, as you look at this distinction of what it means to be a male or a female, it's not that we're just talking about abstract ideas. We're not just talking about philosophies. We're not just talking about thoughts, feelings, or emotions. We're literally talking about our DNA, our neural pathways, and how we are human. This is a beautiful representation of what we talked about last night, about seeing ourselves as a whole person. We are our thoughts and our bodies and our souls all at the same time. And they're not dividable. So, um, so there we go. So is it a choice? Is you being born a woman or a man or standing or sitting here as a male or a female a choice? No, it was given to you as a gift. It was given to you as a gift for your mind and your body and your soul. And helping an individual see that and realize it is really one of the greatest tasks that apparently we're now confronted with and, and, and get, to, get to move to. I mentioned earlier, this is rapid onset gender dysphoria. Now, that's a big loaded term. And, and what it is, is it's representing the fact that, that you have this slow prevalence or this small prevalence of gender dysphoria in the population uh, <clears throat> in our country and in the world. But all of a sudden, now you see it exploded all over the place. You see it uh, being represented in the media, in commercials. You have uh, spaces being made available for these individuals in public settings like bathrooms and locker rooms. Uh, you have school, school, case, or school uh, systems filing lawsuits against cities. You have the Supreme Court, just, or the Supreme Court uh, contemplating taking on cases about these types of stuff. And individuals are trying to figure out why all of a sudden has just this thing just erupted. And the term of that eruption is this rapid onset gender dysphoria. And the reality of it is, and what uh, people are starting to come to realize, is the fact that puberty is hard, right? And especially, especially like I was talking about last night, uh, women particularly. And so when you're struggling through this process of puberty and going through all of the many changes that your body makes during this process, you're full of questions, you're full of disgust at times, discomfort, you have all of this uh, stuff that you wish wasn't happening, happening, uh, all of the social pressure that goes along with this. So you have this moment in an individual's life where they're ripe, ripe for impressionable uh, activity and all sorts of stuff. And you have all of a sudden now all this popular discussion being around this very, this very uh, obscure term and, and, uh, and something that's being celebrated called transgenderism and that's rooted in a mental health condition. And so you start to see individuals starting wondering, well, maybe I do have this. Um, one of the things that's been studied in different parts of the world, especially in, in Asia, is that this rise in transgender identities mirrors the same as uh, eating disorders. So the way we call these is, is cluster spreading, is all of a sudden now you have one individual uh, in a friend or peer group that starts to explore these types of activities, and now all of a sudden, a couple weeks later, there's three or four more. And then there's another friend group that starts doing this. And so it follows the same kind of pattern as uh, eating disorders. Some have even seen uh, similar patterns when it comes to drug use and um, smoking, alcohol use as well. And so you see that this, this, th there should be some red flags going off in our, in our heart and mind as we start to see how rapid this is spreading and how all of a sudden everything that we knew 
Everything that we knew about gender dysphoria is being, um, is being just thrown away without any regard or understanding or thought. In 1990, I think it was, I can't remember exactly, 1990 or 1993, the very first gender dysphoric uh, clinic opened up, and it was opened up in Amsterdam, I believe. When it opened up, it took referrals from around the world. Its first year, it had three. Three. Okay. So you can see how fast this whole landscape is changing. So affirmation. What should we be doing as we're looking at our, our children especially, our younger population as they're contemplating with these ideologies and philosophies and they're exploring things that are way above their understanding when we're talking about clinical uh, diagnoses and, and, and criteria? Well, we've seen this huge push in our culture for affirmation and being able to walk beside these kids and continue to, uh, continue to affirm uh, their choice to become transgender. Now, I want to uh, pause here just for a minute because I want to make a really clear distinction. There, there, is a pro there is an ability to affirm the individual and not affirm the choice and action and behavior of a person. It's it, one of the things that I know that, that, that oftentimes the Christian church ex, has experienced over the last year or, or over the last 10 or 15 years as it, it deals with a variety of social issues is the fact that if we say something is not healthy, all of a sudden we are being judgmental or we're not loving somebody or we're trying to put them down. But being able to tell somebody something isn't healthy sometimes is the greatest form of love and affirmation, holding them up and saying, you're worth this conversation. Your humanity, you as God's creature, is worth this conversation and worth this discussion and worth my time. And that you're not just going to move past it um, and one conversation I had not too long ago uh, with an individual about this topic just, f just absolutely floored them when I said acceptance of behavior and affirmation are completely different. And acceptance of behavior and loving a person can be experienced and uh, are completely different. I mean, to you, my, my, the, the most clear example of this is when we used to live in the city and my little boy at that time, three or four years old, would always want to run and get the mail across the street. And he would run without even looking to go get the mail. And I would yell no, right, or stop. By me telling him no or stop or instructing him, is that a form of abuse or, or hatred or, or misogynistic or, or any of those types of things? No. Being able to stop our kids and tell them no is teaching them value and actually expressing love. Some of the greatest times of showing love is when we say no. Here's an interesting statistic for you. So I had it backwards. So clinically, one in 20,000 males suffer from gender dysphoria. One in 50,000 females. So just as a little bit of a frame of refer reference, if you take the whole population of the state of Minnesota, clinically you can expect less than 200 individuals. Okay? But as individuals are surveyed, one in 215 individuals identify um, as dealing with these types of symptoms and conditions. One, somebody might ask, well, why is that? Well, when was the last time, I don't know, you had an ache or a pain and you went on to uh, WebMD and started putting in your guys' symptoms? What were some of the things that came out? You guys don't do that? <laughs> Scary stuff, right. Yeah, just to show you, my wife made it a rule that I could not go on WebMD anymore, right? Because I had 
all sorts of diseases within like the first couple days of me going on to this thing and self-diagnosing myself. You know, I had rare tumors and this type of cancer and all the, something that's only been experienced in the tropi you know, tropical region. I mean, all this nonsense. And it's because I'm not a, clin a clinician in that, you know, and I'm not a professional. I'm not a physician. I can't take uh, stock and, and exam my, examine myself. In fact, when if you even if you were a clinician, you wouldn't be able to do that to yourself. It's ethically uh, a, vi a, vi a violation of ethics for a clinician to even evaluate themselves and to self-diagnose. So why are we allowing our kids to, to, to move from playing doctor to actually being doctor and then doing things to their body that are irreparable and irreversible? And that brings us into this next conversation about treatments. So here's some of the things that, that uh, the world offers as treatments with our children and our pubescent and post-pubescent children uh, that are uh, suffering from uh, this, this confusion. Social transition. This is uh, the, the least impactful. Uh, this is the very first step of transitioning over to the next gender or to the other gender. Um, and that is seen in people changing their name on Facebook, uh, telling their teachers they want to be identified as a different pronoun, uh, wearing different clothing, um, playing and participating in, in other things publicly, try, uh, uh, representing the, other, the opposite sex. The next level of intrusion is puberty blockers. Um, this, this particular uh, treatment is often referred to, especially out in the, the public sphere, as being simply a pause button. To be able to give kids the opportunity to explore their sexual, their, their, their gender identity, and to be able to make a decision for themselves over time. The interesting thing about this particular one is it goes, go back to that one slide that talked about what is the prognosis of gender dysphoria and what fixes it oftentimes for kids, sometimes 90% of the time, puberty. So what are we doing when we give kids puberty blockers? Prolonging the problem. And not only does puberty blockers prolong the problem and prevent the solution, it also creates even more problems. About, what, 60 to 80 percent of women's bone mass develops during, pu during puberty. So, women, so girls that are given puberty blockers for multiple years, they can expect to go into osteoporosis and have frail bones uh, for the rest of their life. Their uterus is petrified, they become sterile. Uh, they start going into menopause, even at teenagers and early 20-year-olds going into menopause and having to take medicine for the rest of their life uh, to continue to deal with these new medical the interventions that were, supposed, were sold to them as being pause buttons. Right? There is no pause button. Cross home hormone therapies. You can go pretty much uh, to any clinic uh, in a lot of different states. Um, one of the big ones right now is Planned Parenthood, uh, especially the one down in Chicago, uh, being able to uh, come in, do an evaluation of you, partner you with uh, a clinician of some sort, and be able to start giving you these injections of cross-hormone therapies uh, if you pass that litmus test. And remember that litmus test that I showed you about the G.I. Joe and the Barbie? That's the kind of thing that they're asking questions about. Remember, the whole point of this is to break down stereotypes, but you see how woven throughout even the treatment plan, it continues to get reinforced. So cross-hormone therapies, you know, and this is another thing that, uh, that we start to see dramatic impacts on individuals' bodies. Um, it's not just something that, that changes maybe the, the, de the depth of their voice or their gait or those types of things. This is uh, really impacting individuals, you know, the, their, their molecular health and um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of their uh, um, biological aspects of how they can, re reproductive organs and that kind of stuff. And then, of course, finally... Um, as you continue to progress through this, uh, this process of converting, uh, conversion, it's top surgery, right? That is, you know, breast augmentation and that kind of thing. Maybe a, a, a Adam's apple shave if you're a man transitioning to a woman. And then bottom surgery, um, obviously you guys know what that is, the, you know, reconstruction um, of, a, of a phallus or 
uh, turning a phallus into a vagina, which guarantees you that you will be a patient for the rest of your life. Individuals that go through bottom surgery are on antibiotics for the rest of their life. Because what happens to you when you cut yourself? You heal. Remember how you are genetically male and genetically female? So if you cut something off, what's your body going to want to do? Reverse it and heal it and grow it back. It'll be constantly fighting whatever foreign object is put into it. And so you will constantly be under medication and a patient for the rest of your life if you go through this process. Right? And most individuals who, uh, as, they, as you know, studies continue to, un to, to uh, uh, continue to come out, because longitudinal studies are just not possible because of how much time hasn't passed since this became a, a huge fad, uh, and even described to some people as a cult, um, individuals are dying from infection very rapidly because they just can't manage uh, the, uh, the damage that was done to them uh, through these surgeries. So again, we see that this is a pause button. I already talked about that. This is not a temporary conversion, right? Um, it's not something that just stops something, but it actually uh, stays off the solution and then provides lasting complications and issues uh, into adulthood. Um, uh, the other thing that a lot of reason why a lot of clinicians are really not wanting to do this um, is because what they say it starts a cascade, a cascade of intervention. Because as soon as this begins, the whole point of uh, pu uh, puberty blockers is to give the opportunity for the exploration of these other things. And so even though it might be sold as, as something that is just benign, it really is not. It's the first step in the whole cascade of activity. Um, the other thing that, that I think all of this, whether we're talking about trans, regardless of what level of transitional treatments we're talking about, the very point that it's making as individuals are recommended for these types of treatments, it is reinforcing in these individuals' hearts and minds that they are not good enough the way they are and that there's something wrong with them and that they need to do something to be accepted, to be normal. They have to change themselves. And that how, I mean, I, when, I, when I wrap my mind, I try to wrap my mind around that, I just can't believe we got here. Because uh, this has been so, this, this whole concept of teaching our kids that they need to change who they are physically, permanently, in order to be accepted or loved or cherished or valued. When you start peeling back the layers and see what's really lying underneath all of this fancy language, you see just the hurt and the pain and the death that's there and really what's being offered to these kids. So just something else. Now, let's say you want to, you go into some of these treatments and you decide it's not for me. This is something that, you know, they're predicting individuals to start coming out of the woodwork about this in the next 10 years. Um, but in many ways, like I said, even if you decide to transition, in many ways with hormone treatments as it changes your body, uh, such as the case with well, with, I, I didn't finish that sentence, but uh, such as with the case of hormone blockers and cross-hormone uh, cross treatments, you, you deal with osteoporosis, you deal with menopause, you deal with some of these other issues for the rest of your life. So even though they, you might want to detransition, there is no such thing as going back to zero. Right? You're not going to go back. Unless, remember, social, social transitioning, obviously you can go back and take your birth name and you could take your birth gender and all those types of things. But once you start these, these treatments, these other treatments, there is no going back. Surgical transition leaves permanent damage and makes medical dependent on hormones, antibiotics, and further surgeries. You're not going to detransition from that. Uh, those who do this are dismissed as not being real trans. So, so sometimes we'll talk about this. We'll say, well, what about individuals who have explored this, realized it's not good for them, and, and, and doesn't really meet the need that they thought it was, with, that they were struggling with? Doesn't that show that we should have to 
have to maybe approach this a little bit softer, or maybe we should be a little bit more observant instead of just running headlong into this. What the, the trans ideologists will come out and say is, well, the reason why that person uh, detransitioned is because they weren't real trans anyways. It's just like, uh, you know, around Christmas time, if you didn't eat Ludafisk, you're not a real Norwegian, right? And that's that same kind of, con uh, that same kind of uh, well, they weren't really trans anyway, so that doesn't have any sort of statistical or real life implication in trans ideology at all. So it's basically saying, we're just not going to deal with that because it's not real. The other thing that we uh, struggle with when we look at detransition, you know, a lot of times we like to look at numbers, statistics. It's a lot cleaner when we can quantify uh, certain ratios and percentages. One of the reasons why we can't do that with detransitioners is because it's private. A lot of times when individuals uh, decide to, be, uh, to, to venture and dabble in this trans ideology and decide to transition back, it's all done under the, uh, under the framework of the house, home, close interpersonal relationships, at college, those types of things. And once it's done and reversed, they don't, there's no reporting that goes along with that. So there's no real way to track that number. The other thing uh, that is hard for individuals who decide to uh, detransition after they venture into this is that uh, it's hard to get care doing this because the fear of practitioners being labeled as anti-trans, transphobic, and lose their license. So let's say you're working with your doctor for a couple years taking cross-hormone therapy and you go to him or her that next week and say, you know what, this isn't working for me. I'm going to go back to my biological sex. That practitioner is thinking in, in their mind, if I help this person detransition de back to their natal sex, then that means I could be labeled as being a transphobe. I could get file, complaints filed against me and my medical license, and you, they won't have the medical support that they need because the doctors are, um, uh, are being uh, pushed in this way. Not only will the doctors be apprehensive to help individuals uh, detransition, but what we are also experiencing is that parents are then now being really resistant to detransitioning. And the reason is, is because the parent now doesn't want to go against the doctor's advice. And so what started out as being the great... Um, uh, champion for child's rights and letting them self-determine that's only good in one direction because as soon as the other direction starts to be moved on the parents in charge and so is the doctor and they're not going to go against each other one of the things that you're also starting to see now I'm going to kind of change gears a little bit um, in Southern California and some of the other places on the West Coast there's a movement called LBG but not T um, and the reason is, is because what, what uh, the trans ideology is starting to do, if you think about uh, that, that G.I. Joe Barbie spectrum that we talked about last night, when you look at that and you see individuals starting to see maybe effeminate men and things like that, and they say, oh, well, you must be trans, and start talking to individuals in that light, what the LBG community, lesbian, gay, and bi community, are starting to think and starting to feel is that the trans movement is now starting to take all of uh, the individuals that would have otherwise been identify as lesbian, gay, or trans, or as or bi, and so you have a huge movement. Not, I guess it's it, huge might not be the right word, but a movement of individuals disassociating with trans ideology, but holding on to the LBG. And uh, this is something that's really profound when you start to think about the inner workings and the dynamics that are happening with that and the fact that transgender really has nothing to do with sexual orientation. And individuals will, 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 will argue that with different points. But this is one of the things that's intra, you know, that to keep in mind, even when you're dealing with not just trans, but the entire LBGTQIA2S plus category, is that they rarely have anything in common except for the fact that they feel marginalized right, or, mis or underrepresented. But um, lifestyle and those types of things are, have nothing to do with each other. And so you, you start to see 
um, this movement of breaking this up. A lot of times, uh, people in the lesbian, bi, and gay population, they see trans ideology and trans theory as the modern conversion therapy. Right? So where you used to send your gay son or your gay daughter to some place to, uh, to be quote-unquote fixed, now instead of being fixed, you, now you're being ushered into a new gender so that you can express yourself that way. And so there's some societal conflict that's happening over there. Now I want to talk about suicide risk because this is a big thing. Um, uh, in 2011, ABC News had the headline and quote, do you want a dead son or a live daughter? Talking to parents about kids that are struggling with gender dysphoria. And what's better? You, should you just cultivate the fact that your son wants to be a woman and love him and cherish him so that he can live? Or are you going to be that person that causes him to commit suicide? As if these are the only two options. Now there's only one part of your brain that statements like this activate, and that's the reptilian cortex. That's the panic uh, button in your brain, the fight or flight mechanism. It tries to make you think that there are only two options in existence. Now, obviously, if you're a parent and there's only two options to, in existence, what are you going to pick, right? And that's the whole concept of this. But we're not reptiles. We're not animals. We have cerebral cortexes. We have the ability to think and process. And we realize this isn't the only, these are not the only two options. But the whole point of this headline and this quote is to scare the living daylights out of parents everywhere. That's the whole point, not to educate, but to scare. So... Oftentimes when, uh, I know the font might be pretty small on this one, oftentimes in, in modern day, you know, the last couple years, you'll hear statistics thrown around about suicide rates with individuals that identify as trans. It's based on a 2014 study, and it found that 41% of those who identify as transgender have attempted suicide at one point in their life. Now, it's interesting about this study in 2014. If you read the abstract in this study, it specifically tells you that this study was designed with uh, convenience. It's called convenience sampling, which means they get to pick who it was, and it's about proximity and availability and all that stuff. And it says, as it lists out the demographics and the different types of people that participated in this study and the small sample size that it was, that this study in no way should ever be used to represent the general population. So even though when you're talking about, uh, when you hear individuals throw these, these words out, it's one of those things where individuals are just given sound bites to be able to weaponize uh, this kind of false narrative that you're only going to have a dead son or a live daughter. When in reality, these studies at the very onset even self-identify as being Ill, irrelevant and not, uh, not applicable to the conversation at all. And here's some of the reasons why. It said because it didn't take into consideration any comorbidity comorbidity of mental illness, such as depression, eating disorders, hysteria, narcissism, borderline, or any others. Right? Um, they did identify as trans when they uh, when they did have suicidal ideation. Um, now understand, it talked about this study talked about uh, in your. Uh, formative years, so under 19, none of the, ki the people that participated in this study were under 20. When they took the study, they were uh, in their late to mid-20s and older. So no children under 18 were uh, surveyed, even though the statistic being used to re represent children in political discourse. And the highest rates of suicidal ideation were of 18 to 24-year-olds of age. Uh, those individuals were multiracial, less than a high school education, and had an average annual income of below $10,000. Now, when you think about just those little tidbits at the end of that last statement, that right there would automatically make you think that the, the number and the probability of getting individuals to say that they have suicidal ideation would go up if you knew anything about suicidal thought or intervention. Right? And the fact that it didn't take any of these things into consideration, it doesn't, it's not even worth the paper it's written on, in my opinion. My opinion, right? <laughs> okay. 
Now, and like I said, it, it says that it ut utilized uh, uh, convenience sampling. Um, it can't, convenience sampling through re research and statistics, it, it, it is not admissible for in any way for statistical research and can't be used for pro probability sampling. Um, and it says the NTDS, that's what conducted the study. They say that that's exactly what they did. So Northwestern University, pretty close neighbor to us, they actually did some research about suicidal ideation and children. And in 2017, they released a study. This, this study is not highly quoted at all, but it says children, most likely adolescents who threaten to commit suicide, rarely do so, although they are more likely to kill themselves than children who, are not, who do not threaten suicide. Well, okay. Mental health problems, including suicide, are associated with some form of gender dysphoria. All right, so we're talking about, uh, but suicide is rare even among gender dysphoric people. Right. We're going to talk about what they mean by rare in just a minute. But they went on to say there is no persuasive evidence that gender transition reduces gender dysphoric children's likelihood of killing themselves. So when you think about that quote from 2011, ABC, telling you you had only two options, Northwestern 2017 came out and said, as they did their research, statistically, there's no evidence to support that transition therapy at any level reduces the likelihood that a person who struggles with gender dysphoria is less likely to kill themselves or commit suicide. Okay. The idea that mental health problems, including suicidality, are caused by gender dysphoria rather than the other way around. So they, this is what they determined, is that, this, uh, that the, the actual uh, cause um, of, anyways, I'll just read the paragraph. So it says, mental health and, uh, and personality issues call, cause a vulnerability to experience gender dysphoria is currently popular with and, politi and politically correct. It is, however, unproven and as likely to become or to be false as true. So the fact that um, individuals are experiencing this um, have a lot to do with personality, other mental health considerations, other demographic material, um, rather than uh, gender dysphoria. Uh, these are the f uh, uh, professors that put on the study. Um, but so when tracking outcomes, of, of adolescents struggling with child onset gender dysphoria. Um, out of more than 150 cases, only one had committed suicide. Now, I say that not to say that that's a low number. That is an unacceptable number. It should be zero, okay? And I, I know that, you know, as we're talking about suicide rates, I'm, the suicide rates are extremely high, especially here in Minnesota, especially here in our county. Um, but when we're looking at these cases, we're comparing them to general populations. So this is still very high, one in 150 uh, adolescents struggling with gender dysphoria. And the study wanted to figure out why. Why is it that that's still higher than their peers? And that's what they said. We have no idea. I love it when people are confident enough in their profession and in their ability to say, I have no idea. And that's what you had with those professors from Northwestern after they conducted that study. We don't know. There needs to be further, uh, further work done to be able to understand that. Remember that uh, professor and physician up in Canada, uh, Zucker, that I talked about, that they d basically defrocked and threw him out and uh, blasphemed his name and all that stuff about being a horrible person because he came up with the theory of wa watchful, wait or waitful, watchful waiting when it comes to gender adolescent gender dysphoria, that we need to watch and be careful as we care for these kids and see what happens and meet the needs when they arise instead of jumping to these transitions. That was his theory. And the, these, these studies that are starting to come out, like this one, 2017, say, would imply that that's the correct way to approach this. So 2019 study showed that after one year on puberty blockers for children as young as 11, there were a significant increase in the amount of patients stating they deliberately try to hurt themselves. So not only did 2017 Northwest University, Northwestern 
pr disprove the 2011 ABC quote, but here in this particular investigation, they found in 2019 that the application and the use of that very first intrusive form of transition therapy, puberty blockers, that that actually increases suicidal ideation. Now, the reason why this might be true, and this is just my opinion, is because as we make our way through this jungle of trying to figure out who we are as we're pubescent children, and we're not given any sort of direction or guidance, and, and that teaching that God is the one who created you and made you, and, and the one that cherishes you, loves you, and, and that has a divine plan for you in your life, because that's void, you're, you're grasping at straws and wind, as Solomon and David talks about. And so when you move in one direction, you realize it's just as empty in that, uh, in that room as it is in any other room, because there's only one room that's full, and full of food, and, and nourishes you, and gives you truth. And so obviously, as you continue to be fed the, this, this, this teaching, that if you just do this, you'll be happy. If you just change this about yourself, you'll be, you'll be made whole. If you just start being like this person over here, you'll be accepted. Of course you're going to be more and more clinical de clinically depressed because what you're putting your hope in continues to fail you. So again, how, how, uh, you know, how this might be oftentimes what you hear out in the world. You know, and you even heard it um, during uh, that one hearing about abortion when uh, that professor from UC Berkeley was talking about it being um, a person with the capacity of pregnancy's right to an abortion, and you had the senator trying to, Senator Cotton trying to get her to, to identify those people as women. Um, but uh, she stopped the conversation by saying, your conversation is um, uh, causing harm and furthering assaults and, and uh, against people with transgender, and even talking about increasing suicide levels. Well, suicide interventionists, which I am one, we've known for years, talking about suicide and talking about the problem doesn't increase the probability of suicide. So that's, that's a misnomer already. But yet, these are the types of things that continue to, um, uh, continue to be uh, talked about and thrown out there as if they're facts when they aren't. Right? They're just what they are is gotcha questions or, try, or attempts to end the conversation. Individuals who have detransitioned. Now, there's a handful of different examples that I could give you here. If you're interested in reading their stories, they are fascinating. I have, I have some of them. One of these individuals describes the fact that she went across state lines when, and when she was uh, 16, 17, and 18, uh, visiting clinics. She got uh, hormone treatments and therapies. She started doing cross-hormone and therapies. She started go and then she went, started going to college. She started living her life as the other gender and realized about halfway through that this is not something that she wanted to continue on with her life. And she talks about the pressure that she got from her friends and her peer groups that, that she was promoted and, and cherished and held up as such a strong individual because she was doing these things to herself and she was swept away by the attention that she was getting and the accolades and the praise and the, ex and the excitement that the world was buzzing around her with. But then when it all stopped and she decided that she wasn't going to do this anymore, her friends basically walked away from her, ostracized her, called her names, harassed her. All of the people that once said that they cherished and loved her and, and celebrated who she was just completely abandoned her. And she describes it as a cult-like experience, how she was at a young, impressionable age, you know, 16 through 18, dabbling with these ideas and then acting on them in 18 and then going to college and living there in those things and then just being uh, consumed by them, but thankful that she got away from it. And the reason why I, you know, going back to this concept, what drove that individual uh, to 
you know, exploring websites about transgender ideology and, and transgender clinics and transgender treatments is this idea, you know, if we just want to continue to use the G.I. Joe Barbie uh, scale, is saying that there's something wrong with me because I'm a girl, but I like to do all these things over here, and that's typically boy activity or boy, boy stuff. So there must be something wrong with me. When in reality, we talked about that last night, there is nothing wrong with individual women who identify as being strong and independent and assertive and those types of things. God's made us all unique in a variety of ways. I mean, think about Deborah last night, you know, as that, as that, as that, uh, as that mother of all of Israel. So it's a great thing not to conform to the stereotypes of society. This is the one place where I think trans ideology and Christianity come close to touching. Because they will say, they'll say the problem is with cultural stereotypes, but they don't realize that they're reinforcing them. We say, absolutely, society is the problem. Because as Christians, we realize that sin is the problem. We are, our brokenness, how we view and how we live in God's creation, that's the problem. And so we have no problem with being able to say, yeah, this culture has built this, this expectation for what a woman is supposed to be, and that's not right. Because culture is not the holder of truth. The holder of truth is Scripture, God's Word. And that's what we did last night. So, All right. This next part I want to talk about is um, talking about how... Uh, how at least my perception of this, uh, and why I call this unapologetically female, this workshop. When we start to see uh, trans women start uh, uh, moving in uh, to women-only spaces, we see the greatest uh, example, in my opinion, of male suppression in history. Because now everything that was held sacred and secure and everything that was uh, set aside specifically for female safety and those types of things is completely violated and, uh, and, and oftentimes by the very people uh, that, uh, that have always been doing it, right? And that's men coming into women's only spaces, whether it's emotional spaces, physical spaces, and continuing to do that. Um, and this is one of the one of the ways. So again, we talk about we talked about the the importance of why uh, pronouns are important, especially when you are uh, using they or non-specific, non-personal pronouns and descriptions, and how that divorces you from yourself, and how it starts playing a game that you were never intended to play at the first place. So pronouns do count, and they count especially when we're talking about safety. So you could imagine, um, you know, we're, this one's safety. I'll, I'll get to this one in just a little bit, if you allow me, because what we're going to talk about here in a little bit is incarceration rates and assaults and things like that. So we'll talk about safety in a little bit, but you can imagine what that has to do with, right? Being able to be in a locker room or a bathroom or a public space as a woman in a vulnerable place and being surrounded by men. One of the other places is in community, right? You see this in sports safety. Uh, rugby is obviously a big uh, thing out in uh, our neighbors in the UK. And one individual is a, a male uh, a person that identifies as female, plays on the female rugby team, and brags about how he can go out onto the field and, fo and fold the teammates or fold the opposing team like deck chairs because he is so much bigger, so much faster, and he can just con uh, completely destroy uh, his female opponents. He's bragging about it openly, okay? So you see that, um, uh, you see that with sports. Uh, you s obviously see this you know, with the NCAA and some of the issues that are going on uh, right around us. You see this, the importance of, of uh, pronouns um, when it comes to EMS, emergency response, and those types of things. Uh, recently, a couple years ago, there was an individual, it was a, a woman that identified as a male, went into the emergency room, presented as a male, described herself as a male with abdominal pain. It took the emergency room personnel hours to realize that this person was pregnant and the baby died. And it was because they had no idea what was going on. 
with this individual. And you could imagine uh, what would happen if a paramedic shows up on, on a scene to a call about a, a male suffering from a certain issue and walking in and it being a female and then having to convey that to the, the medical team in the emergency room and that medical team having to convey that uh, to uh, radiation and all those different things and how, how that continues to open up uh, more and more opportunities for misdiagnosis and, the and, and uh, mismanagement of healthcare plans, just because. Not only does it do that, but it also causes you a neurological break. So there's this thing called the Stroop effect, S-T-R-O-O-P. And it has studied the fact that when you are confronted with something that you know to be true and are being told that it's not, your brain automatically stops, hesitates, and moves a lot slower because your brain doesn't want you to be doing this. It goes against everything that you are programmed to do. And that also provides a lot of health and safety uh, risks to individuals that say, oh, uh, pronouns don't matter. You can use any pronoun that you want, when in reality it poses a great risk to our community and the safety of it. And, and again, remember, I'm not talking about you know, just the safety of, you know, non-trans people. I mean, that's not what I'm getting at at all. I'm talking about the safety of the trans individual themselves, their health care, their safety, their well-being as being at risk by doing this type of stuff. The other thing that why I say pronouns matter is because um, as, as an individual that helps people sometimes uh, deal with fantasy in their life, um, and maybe it's not fantasy, maybe it's other, other for, you know, thoughts of delusional aspects or, or psychotic episodes. You know, it's, it's important to engage individuals when they're struggling in that way. But being able to walk beside them, promote them and encourage them in their fantasy is very harmful. You can imagine with somebody like a paranoid personality disorder that thinks that their wife is cheating on them. If you walk up to that person in their, in their psychosis and say, you know, I bet she is. Or same type of person who thinks that China is listening on the phone and they have to wear an aluminum hat, you know, everywhere they go, go up to them and say, you know what, I think you're doing the right thing. If we did that in any other situation and setting, we would be called cruel, unethical. But in this particular situation, it's being promoted. In fact, there's a, um, a, a philosopher down in um, uh, you, uh, uh, University of California, um, it is a man that identifies as a woman, philosopher that teaches about this. And the reason why I use Superman as the example is because he uses the example. He says, you know what? You know, throughout the 20th century, the U.S. had no problem accepting the fact that an alien from Krypton was a man. Why is it so impossible for us to accept a woman can be a man and a man can be a woman, if an alien can be. That's because Superman is a comic book, right? That's the difference. The difference is fiction and being able to keep fiction fiction and reality reality. And that, and those, that distinction matters. And the other thing is, is having these women-only spaces and these women-only communities gives the ability for women to celebrate uh, the sanctity of who they are, and to reclaim it. You think of battered women's shelters and, and all of these different places, people, women that are struggling with, with substance abuse and these types of things, being able to rob them of the fact that they can't assemble with women only. Especially when you talk about, like, like I said, those uh, domestic violence sh shelters. Women only places now can't be women only. And so you have men living literally and sometimes in the same room in these shelters with women who were just violently assaulted by men. And so, and, and this goes even into not just shelters, but, in, but into jails. You have female prisoners committing suicide because they have male, uh, male uh, prisoners next to them that identify as women, and they are so traumatized by their past and their background and the struggles that they're dealing with that they can't handle the pre that, that person's presence. It's not that that person's trans or that person is a male. It's about that person and what they're struggling with. And so being able to express and live in that sanctity of womanhood is being taken, right? 
So sometimes, every once in a while, you'll say, oh, well, women-only places? That sounds like a new form of segregation. And sometimes people will say, that's just whole concept of women only, women only bathrooms, women only locker rooms, women only sports teams. It's a new form of Jim Crow laws. It's an interesting approach. But understand that Jim Crow laws, those laws were intended to deny black men and women the ability to vote, get jobs, get an education, to, and that they would be defranchised from society and be infused less than human than whites. That's what Jim Crow laws were from the Reconstruction until the, the 20th century. Right? They, t- t- part of an ax that I always have to grind is I, I get really frustrated when individuals take things like Jim Crow or Nazi Germany and apply it to something that isn't anywhere close to the same thing. Because if we were going to take what was happening during segregation and apply it to the situation that's happening now, this is more accurate. It would be more accurate to think, thinking of Jim Crow to equate women today with an effort to prevent black individuals from seeking protection from white people that want to harm them. So if we're actually going to use Jim Crow as, as a metaphor for what's happening in our society around it, women are the black men running for their safety. And society is preventing that safety from being there. That's what's actually happening. So let me tell you a story. I was at uh, a, uh, actually a suicide intervention uh, training one time, and I, I'm just, I am completely unaware of my surroundings most times, right? And so I'm standing in the back of a room with a cup of coffee. I had just gotten up a few minutes before to get a cup of coffee, and I'm leaning against the back wall. About, I don't know, 15 feet in front of me is a table with a woman sitting at it. About halfway through the presentation of what this new speaker is talking about, this woman comes, gets up, comes over to me, and says, I know you don't know me, you don't know anything about me, but can you please not stand there? Because you standing behind me like that is making me so uncomfortable. I had no idea what was going on. Obviously, this individual had a traumatic past, right? And God bless her for having the ability to come and talk to me about it. What did I do? I moved. I went and sat down next to her and we talked. And I could totally understand it. I mean, if this strange guy that you never met before is standing behind you, leaning up against the wall, and you have a traumatic past, uh, obviously, you know, maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe I, something was different about me that day. I don't know. But, uh, but the thing is, is, is that by her doing that, she wasn't being oppressive to me. Being a woman and, 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 and realizing uh, your experience and seeing it as real and wanting safety and health to accompany your life, that's not you being oppressive. But that's exactly what this, this concept means when people are saying that this new approach to feminism, uh, you know, anti-trans feminism, is just a new form of oppression when it is absolutely not in any way, shape, or form. So let's talk about safety. So one in six transgender individuals have been incarcerated at some point in their life. One in six, okay? So um, to just give you a perspective, that one in 37 is the United States for general population. Of those incarcerated, so one in six are incarcerated, over 60% of those individuals are for sexual assault. 40% of those uh, and 40% of that one in six is for rape and attempted rape. Compare that to roughly 3% of those biologically female who are imprisoned for sexual violent crimes and 19% of biologically male. So when we're talking about these individuals entering female spaces, right, there is a real risk. It's not something that is imagined. It's not a bias. It's none of this stuff that a lot of times people are trying to make us feel guilty for feeling a certain way. It is perfectly reasonable, responsible, and okay for a woman not to want to get undressed in front of a man. And I can't believe I have to say that. Okay? So let's keep talking about this. Here's a UK example. In 2019, roughly 88,000 people were incarcerated. Out of those, 4,000 were female. Now in the UK, 
Police have to record trans women as women in their booking and reports. Since then, one in 50 inmates identify as women. So you're starting to see individuals take this thing that was, had very small prevalence if we started about tonight. Right? One in 20,000 for women. One in 50,000 for men. And I'm not saying that the, the jail is just full of a bunch of individuals that are trans -identi uh, identified. I'm saying that individuals are taking it, 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 exploiting this new fascination and fad and cult-like movement in our communities, in our society, to bring about real damage on women. Because these individuals, these one in 50 individuals who identify as female, now have to be housed in female correctional centers. And those individuals are rapists, and sexual assaultists, and those types of things. And what they have now starting to develop and find is that individuals who have been incarcerated for rape, habitual rape, those types of things, who identify as women, get sent into female correctional centers, reoffend against their fellow inmates and against uh, the uh, correctional officers themselves. There's been several cases where individuals have been pulled out of female correctional facilities, put back into male facilities, and given life sentences because of those types of things. Gender neutral option. Sometimes people say, okay, well, you're talking about male correctional facilities, female correctional facilities. Why don't we just provide gender neutral bathrooms? That will fix all the problem, right? Well, they've started to do studies on gender neutral bathrooms. In one swimming pool um, in the United K, in the UK, 90% of the sexual assaults that happened against women in, in, at that swimming pool happened in these gender neutral spaces, 90% of them. Right? So women are sexually assaulted by men invading their spaces. This is, you know, this is the thing that we can understand uh, about all of this situation is why is this, why are these spaces so important for women? It's because once men enter them, then all of a sudden the potential of harm is there because men are the ones that do it. Right? Very rarely, very, very rarely does a woman sexually assault another, another woman, right? So I have this question, so I want to make sure you understand. I'm not saying that if you identify as transgender or suffering from gender dysphoria, that that means that you are a sexual offender and a violent offender. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm just saying what they're finding inside of the correctional facilities and what is co-occurring with a lot of these identities, okay? And, and the fact that your intuition about how this is potentially uh, a, a vulnerable and unsafe sp space is statistically probable, okay? And here's why. <clears throat> Crimes against women. This is current right now, going on today. One in three women have been violently or sexually assaulted in their lifetime. We have a lot of women right here. One in three. One in two in poor regions of the world, such as South Africa or Sub-Saharan Africa. South A Southern Asia or, or sub Saharan Africa. Seven in ten individuals who are victim of human trafficking are women. And every nine seconds, a woman is assaulted in America. We've been here for an hour and a half already. Well, I'm going slow today. An hour and a half. There's a reason why that story, you know, that last night when I talked about uh, that coworker walking out to the parking lot, why she parks underneath lights. And us guys, we take that safety for granted. Right? Nine seconds. So no wonder there is a built-in need for safety and a constant evaluation of that space. So trans activism is a subversive attack on women. It's also on a lot of different a lot of different minorities, like refugees or children, veterans, senior citizens, disabled, recovering addicts, reintegrated uh, offenders, 
uh, unemployed, the homeless, the human trafficked, victims of violence, low-income minorities, mentally ill, autistic, gender dysphoric especially, right? Because it's, it's t- turning this thing into something that it's not. Uh, uh, you have intersex people being sucked or being wrapped up in this, homosexuals as well, parents. And the, the reality of it is, is that we're here to help and to be able to equip and to defend and to support individuals um, uh, so that we can continue, uh, so that we can continue to provide for, for what is hurting and harming uh, people. But when all these resources and all these things are focused in on one aspect, we start to see the, the, the removal of resources and safety and security and health from all these other different groups as well. So what's our response? Is it okay if I keep going, guys? All right, let me, let me just keep going. If you need to get up and stretch or go to the bathroom, go for it. All right. A lot of times when we talk about trans ideology, we immediately assume the sky's falling. What are we going to do, right? What are we going to do? Our culture is just on fire. What's happening? So we start to panic like Chicken Little. But the reality of it is if we actually calm down, take a step back, we realize what this problem is about. This problem is about identity. What are our kids struggling with? Identity. What are our adults struggling with? Identity. Who they are, the purpose of their life, and how we can help them. And boy, can we help them. The church is uniquely equipped by God to provide individuals with this truth. So instead of seeing this as, an op- as the sky is falling, there really is no better time in history to be a Christian because you are armed with what the community around us absolutely needs and wants and is craving. The only problem is, is oftentimes we're relegated or we're screamed over and the, pr- the uh, primary voices of this world are offering something else in exchange. So when we talk about individuals' identity, those kids in our 11th and 10th and 9th and 8th grade struggling with all those thoughts, we get to walk beside them and tell them that God created you in in his image to have a a unique vocation in, in the order of his creation and that he is intimately involved in your life and that he knows you. We get to walk beside uh, our kids and, and our friends, our coworkers, or our neighbors and say, have you not read that he who created you from the beginning made you, made you who you are, male and female? And, and, and that that's wrapped up into the whole ordering of society. Man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become flesh so that they are no longer two but one. What God therefore has joined together, let no one separate. A lot of times we, we see these passages and immediately what we think they are is, is constant law coming down and informing us what we are and what we are not supposed to be doing. But here, Christ is opening our eyes to who you are and how you relate to this beautiful creation he's given you. Not this gender-bred person where you're constantly uh, examining different parts of your life and trying to figure out how your, your gender, you're expressing yourself according to some, uh, some form of gender. But you are a mind, a body, and a spirit wrapped up as one, united. And again, some of these passages you guys have already seen, right? You should love the Lord your God with your whole heart, mind, and soul, with all your strength. And, uh, and then, again, in First Thessalonians, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the very first step in our response is to see the person. You know, like I said, that one page that I showed you at the very beginning with all those different things that are wrapped up in trans ideology or, or transgender uh, things is, is really, it, it can be overwhelming and very confusing. So the very first thing is to just, uh, as soon as we start talking about these, realize that it's an individual who is standing in front of you and talking, and you need to know who they are and what's going on with them. So learn what they're saying, just like you're learning a different language. What are they saying about themselves, their identity? What are they really struggling with? Take the time to be with them. Be compassionate. Right? Suffer alongside these people. These individuals, like I said, when we're talking about their clinical diagnosis, this is persistent and prolonged discomfort and dysfunction. So walk beside them and think long term. We love short fixes, silver bullets, magic pills. 
we have been called as Christians into relationships with one another, to love each other. And that doesn't happen in five-second bursts. It happens over a lifetime. And that what that person is dealing with, regardless of if it's gender dysphoria or any other thing that's going on in their life, it's only part of their story. And that story will change. Because even, gender, even this trans ideology, it's based on fleeting things. It's based on emotions, impulses. Those will change. Be that thing in their life that doesn't change. Romans 12, 14 to 18. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not, excuse me, do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. This, con- this idea of our calling as Christians to empathize with people to walk with them and to care for them, hold them up and strengthen them. Live in harmony with one another. Don't be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. But this whole idea of seeing people as people, not as arguments to be won, not as things to be avoided, but as individuals that need help. Psalm 82, we've already seen this past. Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and destitute and rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver the, them from the hand of the wicked. First Peter 4, you've all been given gifts. All of you have spiritual gifts. God's equipped you with very, uh, varying things. So all Peter is saying is use it. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. As good stewards of God's very grace, whoever speaks as one who speaks of oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong the glory and dominion forever and ever. So we walk beside these individuals who are suffering from identity issues, depression and anxiety, who are looking for truth and longing for it. We're not there to win an argument, to shout down political discourse, to enter into all these, this, you know, minutia of these loud yelling voices and things that are going on, but to see the person that is standing in front of us and love them in the truth, speaking the truth in love and giving hope. Because a lot of times, individuals who are wrestling with this do not have hope. You know, that, that, that study from Northwestern University said they have no idea what causes this increase in suicidal ideation. Well, universally, regardless of what that person is struggling with, if, there's, if they are suffering from suicidal ideation, um, it's a lack of hope. You have hope in full measure, and so being able to provide it is our calling. So, and realizing that today, going back to, you know, this uh, garden moment kind of concept, this isn't new. You know, uh, Solomon said it, you know, whatever, uh, you know, uh, what has been will be, and what has been is, uh, has been done. What is, I'll start over. What, (laughs) what has been is, uh, what will be and what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. You know, we're seeing it maybe manifest in different ways, but this attack on God's truth, the sovereignty of God's creation, the sanctity of the human body, all of it is just the same. Right? Um, and here's just a couple more passages as we look through Second Corinthians 4. You know, you, your body might be struggling, individuals might be struggling with their, their physical concept, their physical reality, even, even those with gender dysphoria, uh, but realizing that their physical nature isn't their sole identity, that they're like those who have treasures and jars of clay, right? and that that surpassing power of their life, it belongs to God and not to us. And we may be afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed and not driven to despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down and not destroyed, always carrying the body of the, the body of the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in us. And just continuing, so we don't lose heart. 
Though our outward nature, our outward self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. As individuals are struggling with these physical realities about themselves, they don't need to change or augment their body in some way or or go to procedures or do hormone therapies. No, renewing your inner self and your inner nature is something that God gives you through his word and, and continues to walk beside you. So for this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal way to glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen, those things, those things are eternal. And then 1 Peter, I'm just kind of wrapping through a lot of these, I apologize. But blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, he's caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in this last time, in that last time. One, I think this is, uh, so for God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is hugely important as we're ministering to individuals. Uh, is, is reminding them that, you know, the job of the church isn't to send people to hell. The job of the church is to show people Jesus. And that's what we're doing as we're walking beside them. Right? Um, so Jesus who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up. Philippians 3, brothers, join in imitating me. Keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example in us. For many have often told you and now tell you even with tears as walk as enemies of those of the cross, of, of the uh, enemy of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. And they glorify in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship, our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject all things to himself. Even in that text, it talks about how our bodies often are broken, but yet we have that fulfillment in our Lord's resurrection. So. And I, this, is, this, this should be the last scriptural passage. And it goes back to the beginning of last night. Because as we think about our response, the most important thing that we should think about in our response is how we see the person that we're talking with. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. You're not fighting against your second cousin's grandchild's best friend, right? That's not something that you're arguing with. We wrestle against uh, against the schemes of Satan. So finally, finally be strong in the Lord and in, and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in this present age. You know, when you, when you listen to the news, when you read the newspaper, when you're on Facebook, people are at each other's throats. The other person isn't the issue. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. People aren't, aren't uh, the, the ones that are, 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 are simply the, the ones that are cultivating this type of thing. This is, this is something that is opposed to God's creative order. And we have to see who, who ultimately is behind all of that. And that person, Satan, is our enemy. So the sky isn't falling. No, instead, we get to wait a savior. And we have, we, as part of our response, the first thing we get to do as we leave here is to stop thinking like we have something to lose. Right? But instead, live like you have everything to give. That's basically what our response is. You have what you need to be able to have this response. And that's, uh, it's simply uh, going and sharing it. And remembering that what we're talking about here is nothing short of the pinnacle of God's creation, womanhood. And remember, man didn't get his identity, his full identity, until woman stood on the earth. And he got to see her with his own eyes. And 
with that and the sanctity wrapped up around who she is, we get to see the culmination of God's creation. So, as we make our way forward and as we see so many different societal pressures trying to uh, relegate women's safety in a variety of different places, remove the sanctity of their body, the holiness of their creation, the, the full pe- person of who they are, and try to get us to, to take the, that, that beauty of womanhood, that person that God created with his own hands, uh, and, and to apologize for it, we get to be unapologetically female. So reclaiming what it means to be a woman. And that's, that's it. I only went like 10 minutes over. So that's good. I'll have to shorten a couple of those slides. Any questions that you guys have? I have a lot of stuff tonight, so yes. Yes, yeah, yeah. There's a kernel of truth in that. Mm-hmm. That I think God gives us a great deal of freedom to think what we want to do with our lives. But isn't that some human rebellion? And I, I think that's exactly it. So the question is, is that Emma Watts, Watson, I forget, but uh, saying that I don't want anybody to choose for me who I am or, or what that kind of stuff, is that human rebellion? The, you know, that, that is Garden Eden stuff too, right? As Eve saw that it was good for, you know, that the fruit was good for eating and good for making one wise, right? Taking matters into our own hands um, and being that we could have a mind like God. That's what, uh, to, that's what Satan allured uh, to be like God, even though ironically they were like him bearing his image. That sin is what continues to propel us, is to be our own gods. We want to create ourselves, and we want to be in charge of every aspect of ourselves. You know, even dis- disregard our chromosomal uh, formation. We want to be able to even be able to change that. Right? So, God really said yeah. to be female. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And then the and, question I have is... <laughs> Mm-hmm. I... Yeah. So honestly, so this is this is something that a lot of a lot of people are are, are fighting against, right? Um, having men enter into female sports. To give you an example, especially post puberty, after puberty, men's bodies have already changed. Their mus- muscle skeletal structure has already changed, and lung capacity. lung capacity, all that kind of stuff. Not not only that, but in the now in the Olympics. Uh, This was 2016. I don't know what it is now, but in 2016, if a man wanted to compete in the Olympics as a woman, he had to have a testosterone level of less than 10, right? Women generally have a testosterone level between one and three, somewhere in there, right, in their bodies. A regular functioning man has a testosterone level somewhere in the course of 300 to 1,000. So... Even if you think of the, the limitations that they're putting on men who want to perform in, um, in female athletics of being less than 10, if a woman can only produce one to three, that still is nowhere close to us. Because you're never going to be able to get a man's testosterone, regardless of the transition that he's taken, less down to what a woman's level is as well. And the transition of the body and the... Mel- so it's... It's just absolutely, you know, like I said last night, I have three older sisters, right? I can't imagine, my, you know, my heart goes out to these girls that, are, that we raise to be proud of who they are and to do their best just so that they can uh, um, be folded like a deck chair, you know? Yeah. You know, and again, it has a concept of identity. You know, I mean, if that's what is defining for a person and, and where they're finding a sense of identity, then you could imagine why they would celebrate that, right? And be told that they should be proud of it. Because oftentimes in our culture, that word proud and pride, it's being used in really weird ways nowadays. It wasn't too long ago that the word pride was not a thing you wanted to be told you were, right? 
You know, if you were prideful, that meant you were arrogant. But now, being prideful is something completely different and a characteristic that we're trying to cultivate. And what pride does is it separates, it lifts people above other individuals, it destroys communities. James, the book of James has a lot to say about pride uh, dividing uh, inside the church and needs to be watched out for. Yes, Sue? Um, on a local level, I've someone brought to our attention that our why is letting trans in the locker rooms. Yeah. And that just makes my heart sick. Yeah. And so how do, how do we respond to that? Because when I grew up, YMCA stood for, the C stood for Christian. Yeah. Now, you know, if I walk into a locker room, which I should do more of, and I see that, that's the last time I'll walk in a Y. Yeah. yeah. And that's all I can think of. But it made me really sick to know this was their policy now. Yeah. And, and what's, for me, what, what the, what one of the, the hard part is, is, is that you see agencies, industries, uh, social groups doing this type of thing in the name of compassion. But what are they doing in the name of compassion? They're taking everything women fought for for the last 150 years and throwing it away and putting women in very vulnerable and dangerous situations. It removes the compassion from women. Yeah, yeah. And that was what that, that one slide that I went through real quick is, you know, this intentional subservient attack on women. Because, and in the name of compassion, right? I, you know, it's, I've seen a lot of different literature and stuff come out where people will say, in the name of compassion, you need to give X and Y and Z up, right? So you can make, uh, so somebody might see you as compassionate. Well, there are certain hills we're dying on. And women's safety, women being abused every nine seconds, for me, that's worth a fight. So, yeah. A little bit of a frustration, I guess, a little question to follow that, but, um, so, you know, I feel like sometimes the churches, instead of wrestling with principalities and holding hands with the principalities, yeah. and so what are, you know, what are pastors, priests, clergy doing to, you know, train or get more up to speed on this issue and, and go against the principalities rather yeah. than dancing with them? So um, for, for us, particularly this church, we've, we have a lot of resolutions and actions and task force that are trying to tackle this particular issue and how it's, inf how it's impacting ministry. Uh, you have a lot of other uh, church bodies that have, uh, have given in to this concept that God is sovereign. So if you're born with some sort of gender dysphoric condition, that God must have wanted you to be that way. And so that's the theology informing the practice where all of a sudden now you have these individuals being, uh, that are struggling with this, kind of, this concept being, being embraced, cultivated, and, up, and lifted up as being a, a great example of living who God made you to be. Um, but remember, God didn't intend you to have persistent, prolonged discomfort and dysfunction in your life, right? And, and what are we supposed to do as we walk with each other, as we see individuals struggling, that all the Psalms and those passages that I talked about, we walk beside each other and carry each other up. If I, somebody next to me has an alcoholic, uh, alcohol addiction, I'm not going to give them a bottle of Jack Daniels for Christmas and say, you know, you go be you right? You're going to walk beside them and help them. If someone is struggling with diabetes, uh, you're going to make sure that, you know, hopefully they're watching their blood sugar. So you're going to help them manage their life and what it means to live in this broken body in this broken world affected by original sin. And you're going to know what, uh, God, you know, and, and look at Genesis 1 and 2 at what God's intended creor, created order looked like instead of Genesis 3 and following. Because if you look at Genesis 3 and following and think that's the way God wanted things, then that means we're in a lot of trouble, right? But that's why when we, ever, when we looked at God's creative order and what was the eternal nature of a woman, we were in Genesis 1 and 2. So, yeah. Yeah, Teresa? Well, um, going to school and stuff when I got my education... 
we were taught to treat body, body mind, and spirit mm -hmm. as, as we were going through training. And so um, professionals now, um, like psychiatrists and psychologists, do they incorporate those three aspects, or can they incorporate Yes, good them? ones do, yeah. Okay. So, so I, you know, I didn't know if, yeah. if that was like... Yeah. No, and, and it used to be, you know, years ago, you know, psychiatry had its beginning in the church, right, in the pastor's office. And eventually it branched off into being a profession and a, a psychiatric world was developed and they had psychologists that were specialized and trained in certain things. And you started to see this giant chasm between the church and psychology. And eventually, uh, you know, in the mid to late uh, 20, 20th century, even people saying that they had nothing to do with each other and souls were made up and a lot of atheism and agnosticism that was represented in that field. But since then, since about the 90s up until now, they have a huge swing back to incorporating spiritual health and life uh, into uh, mental health. And so you'll even... Uh, even national incentives to get faith communities involved in mental health awareness and treatment. And so that's a, it's a big swing that's happened relatively recently. Yep. Any other thoughts or questions? In the back. <laughs> so, I mean, how do we deal with some of the, the laws yeah. that are coming up that are saying you can't not do this? You, you know, you have to do certain things you can't not do this child. You know, that is, that's going to be, you know, for instance, well, for example, that's a, a very specific question for specific individuals at certain times, right? You, so the question is, you know, what about certain laws that say you have to treat people these ways if they identify this way and that kind of stuff? And, and um, you know, how do, we, how do we interact with that? Um, I think that you continue to do what, what Scripture continues to command you because we must obey God rather than man when it comes to these types of things. Uh, one example of what you're talking about uh, happened in British Columbia a few years back. It was a woman that owned um, a cosmetology uh, business in British Columbia, and part of that business, she did Brazilian waxes. Now, you guys know what that is, right? Well, look it up sometime. <laughs> Anyways, this individual, this business owner, gets, gets, uh, um, gets approached by a man and says, well, I want to, uh, and, and the man says, I want a Brazilian wax. And she says, no, I only give Brazilian waxes to women. He then tries to um, extort her for $2,500, threaten her to take her to court if she, and if she doesn't give him the $2,500 on apology. So she gets a, an attorney and they go to court. Now, the, the court recently, that court si decided that in that particular setting, no woman should be forced to be confronted with men's genitalia that don't want to do it professionally or privately. So she had all the right to refuse him. Now, you have different states around our country that are, that are ru ruling and making decisions in different, um, in, in, you know, according to different rules. I don't know what a different court would rule, right? But for her, at the end of the day, I don't think it would matter whether or not she was found guilty of oppressing this person or not, because she had that, that this, this core compulsion. Um, and, you know, you see this in a variety of other reasons too. You know, and they, they went into the, the gruesome details of why it's not okay to have men have Brazilian waxes because of skin tissue and certain things like that and how ridiculous it was. Um, but yet, at the end of the day, the, I think the judge ruled in the right, you know, that this was, this was an unacceptable position that this person was trying to put a woman in. What, what, what was there to gain by this besides forcing somebody to do something they fundamentally didn't want to do? Yeah, you know, and so and that's, this is, this is one of the things that, that we, you know, you know, and I think that the courts are struggling with this in real time. I mean, I think that was one of the, 
uh, the question is, how are we dealing with this in the church? Well, the church is dealing with this in real time, too. And like I said, the things that I wrote about a year ago are, are different. The terminology and everything is different than it is today. And so they're wrestling with a lot of things, too. You know, um, even being able to, in, on legal documents, decide whether they should put the word gender or the word sex, because sex means biology, what you were born with. Gender means what you feel like today. You know. And so if you're in a career, and I think you're going to see this, my, I have relatives that have left the medical profession, not, simple, not because of this issue, but because it has changed so much over the last few years, and they don't want to be put in positions um, career-wise um, as human beings to do something that violates uh, their, their core belief. And so maybe you're going to start seeing uh, businesses move Places close, people change careers, and start start actually doing, living their life according to what they actually believe and what really matters to them. So, any other thoughts? Yeah. Um, I want to make sure I have this right first. Uh -oh. You said the prevalence of gender dysphoria in natal males is one in twenty thousand. One in fifty. Yeah, one in twenty. Yeah. Females, one in fifty thousand. That's correct. Which means in males, it's. More than twice as common. That's correct. And that's my reading and also my experience working in area schools is that it's the girls that are mm -hmm. blocking. Yep. And that's that is part of that rapid uh, gender dysphoria, right? Yeah. That rapid onset gender dysphoria that you're seeing because not only are you know one in two hundred and fifteen individuals identifying to be on this be gender uh, diverse or whatever how gender uh, transgender but that the majority of them now are female, which is contrary to every statistical evidence-based model that we have. And so it's why is this happening? And that one slide about puberty is hard, that's where most of the professionals are coming down on it, is because, because puberty for women is uh, fundamentally harder on women than it is men. And so... And that social effect evidently is coming into play. Yep, and that's why they're liking this rapid onset gender dysphoria to eating disorders. Because of that social pre pressure and those, that cluster formation that's starting to, where you start to see it, where you have one a female peer group, all of a sudden one person starts, you know, going online and, you know, having these gender questions and then pretty soon identifies as transgender and then three of them do, right? And then the, the group next to them does as well. Just like, it spreads just like that uh, eating disorders. They're, and like I said, they're even likening towards smoking and drug use and stuff like that. So, yeah. Yeah. I think it's very irresponsible to plan Because supposedly the people that give the care are supposed to be doctors. And if you know all of this information as a lay person, yeah. those doctors very well know it too. And they are doing a horrible disservice to their patients. Yep. And and you have a lot of a lot of professionals coming out that are saying, that are warning these individuals and, have, and are even just saying that, like these neurobiologists that are coming out and saying, listen, you physicians, you civic servants, you've been warned. So when all of this comes back, because it will, you've been warned, you have no excuse. And that's, it's, it's you know, that's, that's a real life thing, so, yeah. So, Pastor, we've talked about puberty, mm -hmm. so, and then we talked about post-puberty, yeah. so what, what kind of age group are we looking at now, because I thought... 14 to 18, so... Okay, there, yeah. so I was thinking uh, uh, a woman's menstruation tends to be starting sooner. I, I yeah, 11 to 14, somewhere in there, okay. is kind of what they think of pubescent age, you know, okay. and then 14 to... To 18. So post puberty would be like 19 and well 14 to 18 something like that when we're looking at those that graphic you know you know we're looking at teenagers that have moved through puberty so you know juniors and seniors in high school you know first year college students young adults so yeah 
Any other questions or thoughts? Well, hopefully you, uh, hopefully you learned something and that you're, you've already started your car if you have remote start. So, all right. Why don't we pray before we go? <clears throat> Lord, we thank you for today and uh, the gift of always being able to gather here around your word and your calling uh, as your child in, in relationship with others. We ask that you use this information to be able to, to plant seeds of compassion and empathy towards those individuals who are really struggling with, uh, with the issues that we see around us and give us words and hearts to be able to meet them where they're at and to be able to share your love and truth with them. And Lord, we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.